um, to today's meeting. Um, we are just short Christopher Stalford at this stage, but he may just be finishing up after his other committee meeting this morning. We have George and Martina by Starleaf, and everybody else is present in the room. Um, today, I could just ask members to note that their mobile devices, just to make sure that they're away from the microphones in case they cause any interference. Um, if we could look today then at, first of all, item one for apologies. Um, we have no apologies because we know who's here. Um, do we have minutes from last week? No, we we'll can do week. that again. Okay. Yeah. So then look, we can move on then to item two, which is the Brexit, the oral evidence sessions with, first up is Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council. So members on page five to page 125, uh, of the meeting pack and general are the general papers for what we are doing today, and there is a briefing paper from Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council, which is a page 126 of the meeting pack. Hopefully, technology will be working for us well, and we should have a uh, councillor Robert Foster, who is the chairman of the operations committee for Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council, and Clifford Todd, who is the head of environmental health uh, at the council as well. Um, you're both very welcome to today's meeting. We thank you for coming along. Um, just to advise you that the session is being recorded by Hansard and a transcript will be published on the committee webpage. Um, and what we'll do is if we just take the opportunity to let yourselves do a short presentation uh, and then we'll let members come in and ask questions on the back of that. And we will stick to the 25 minutes time that's allocated because we've got sort of six councils this afternoon. So. You're the first, so we'll, we'll pass it over to yourselves to, to set the standard. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and just before I start, you may not be aware, but your deliberations were audible to us here. Um, prior to us joining there, so um, I'm disappointed <laughs> Trevor didn't want to ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> Caught Trevor. <laughs> I, I, I will remember that, Trevor. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, Chair and Committee Members. Um, my name is Robert Foster, and I am here today representing Andrew and Newton Abbey Borough Council. Uh, I am Chair of the Council's Operations Committee, and I'm an Ulster Unionist Councillor for the Macedon DEA. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to address this committee on this very important matter. I'm here today with Clifford Todd, who is Andrew and Newton Abbey Borough Council's Head of Environmental Health, and Clifford will be presenting shortly in relation to the issues which we see arising from the UK's exit from the EU for the Council's regulatory role with food businesses. We sent a short paper setting these uh, issues out, which I hope is useful in your deliberations. Um, I would like to begin by making some comments in relation to the wider impact for businesses in our borough um, in regard to Brexit. This is important as we have the highest number of transport and logistic companies in Northern Ireland. For these businesses, the potential implications include delays or queues, the uncertainty around uh, potential uh, checks and processes, the potential for customers or suppliers outside Northern Ireland not being aware or up to speed on requirements, and finally, the potential impact on costs. Uh, regarding manufacturing, again, the, number, the borough has a number of key manufacturing companies, including Sensata, CRC Global, and RLC, all of which may be impacted through supply chains, production costs, and uncertainties around demand for their products. This may lead to decisions in future in relation to location, for example. Conversely, it's important to say that some companies which have recently invested in the borough anticipate opportunities for Northern Ireland emerging as a result of Brexit due to what will be a unique trading position, e.g. Erigal Contracts, who have purchased, purchased the Angolon site in Antrim, which Trevor will be aware of, and Moscow Group, which has brought the Slumberjay site in Newton Abbey. Finally, as part of the UK's government's vision post-Brexit, an ambitious free ports policy is proposed. Around the world, free ports operate as secure custom zones, usually located at ports where businesses, uh, business can be carried out inside the country's land border, but where different custom rules apply. It is anticipated that the UK free port model will maximise geographic flexibility to reflect best the different assets and needs of parts and regions across the UK. The government has designed this model to apply effectively to areas with seaports, airports and rail ports, and to regions featuring multiple ports. No mode of port or area is excluded. The UK government is working with the devolved administrations on establishing at least one free port in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. This could create a potential opportunity for the ports of Belfast, Larne and Warren Point, but also Belfast International Airport, which is within our borough. 
given its accessible location and significant supply of land with development potential. I thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me to address you, and I will now hand over to Clifford Todd. Clifford. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Uh, Chair, a little con uh, conscious that the potential impact of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union is much wider. I wanted to take a few minutes of the time that we have available to highlight some of the uncertainties that environmental health face in trying to advise and support businesses in the borough at this time. The major challenges for us currently relate to the movement of products of animal origin. This will, of course, have a greater impact in the council areas with a border control point, and I'm sure you'll hear more from those councils later this afternoon. It still remains unclear as to the precise level of detail that will be required by businesses to comply with the new control regime due to commence on the 1st of January 2021. This regime relates solely to the movement of products of animal origin from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, and currently each consignment would require a pre-notification to the destination port and be accompanied by the appropriate documentation, which at this stage is likely to include an export health certificate. This process may be mitigated to some extent by the proposed trusted trader scheme. However, this, as I understand it, is still under discussion and is subject to agreement with the European Union. Our environmental health staff have been working very closely with DERA colleagues and the other delivery partners to assist businesses in whatever way we can. But this can only really be achieved once the final detail of this transition program is made available. And as with much of these preparations, time is of the essence. As you can see, Chair, the uncertainty around this process raises questions for both businesses and council in terms of the resourcing that will be required to ensure compliance with the scheme and ultimately the movement of these food products. For some businesses, this will include the printing of labels with new identification marks that would be required to be applied to and accompany certain products of animal origin that are placed on the GB, NI, EU and non-EU markets at the end of the transition period. Our businesses are already inquiring if they can go ahead and start printing these labels bearing the identification marks. However, this too is not straightforward as without a negotiated deal being in place, these marks may be changed or not required and the businesses may incur unnecessary printing costs. Similarly, the lack of clarity around the level of checks required on the movement of these products makes it difficult to estimate with great certainty the demands that may be made on the Council's Environmental Health Service. It's essential, therefore, that the costs incurred by the Council are fully funded through cost recovery or government grants. And as I've already indicated, due to the high degree of uncertainty at this stage, it's essential that the funding is flexible and kept under review so that it can be increased if actual cost exceeds current estimates. Unfortunately, it's not possible at this stage to estimate what these costs will be as it involves additional requirements, including monthly inspections and increased sampling for those businesses that may be planning to export through Great Britain to the European Union. Finally, Chair, for me, as, it current, as it's currently unclear that all the necessary arrangements will be in place on the 1st of January, or in fact that a deal will have been agreed, clarity is required on the contingency arrangements to ensure that trade is not adversely affected and avoid unnecessary delays at the point of export. For example, food labelling changes and changes to packing, packaging rather, may not be in place as these issues are still subject to negotiation. Chair and committee members, um, thank you again for your time this afternoon and we are open to Q&As from the committee. I believe it's Martina, having listened to your deliberations before we started. Uh, yes, uh, Martina, we'll pass over to yourself to ask a question there. Uh, can I thank you both for, for being in attendance and, and for the presentation and information uh, that you've sent around. And I'm not going to uh, touch on the issue of free ports because I do think it's still a bit of a half-baked idea that's going to mitigate against Brexit. But when you were talking about funding, Councillor Foster, um, the loss of funding, has the um, has the district, the council, done a calculation of the kind of funding that would be lost for farmers, for groups and organisations, whether it's European Social Fund, um, I know there's been, you've talked about trade, but I'm wondering, have you a calculation of, given that there's 3.5 billion going to be lost to the north of European funding, how much will that mean for your council? 
we haven't done a calculation on that. It's a very a finger in the air thing, I would say, and I don't even know who you would make a funding application to to say that you were right this amount of money with Northern Ireland being impacted through this. Um, Clifford, would you have any thing to add to that? No. Uh, no, Chair. Sorry, we don't have. Uh, it just would be impossible to say at this stage. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, especially when it's, 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 nobody knows what's, what, what, the, what is going to happen. We're five weeks, six weeks out from this, and there's still nothing concrete in paper to say what you're going to have. You can't even print a label to say what you're going to have. So um, I think to try and put a quantitative figure on anything would be impossible. Yeah, but, yeah. Just, Chair, if I can with you, because I would suggest maybe Councillor Foster. There has been talk of a prosperity fund where the British government said it was going to replace funding. So see about whatever happens, and there's obviously massive problems with trade, and you know there's no good Brexit here. But I'm wondering, um, for your area, there's going to be a, nom a figure that's going to be lost, like farmers are losing their single farm payment. Pillar two. Um, it's going to be gone. So all of those groups and organisations that deal with European um, Rural Development Fund, that goes. The European Social Fund for the groups and organisations in your area, gone. You know, peace fund, and I don't know if you get any, but for instance, that we're hoping that we have peace for, and we're hoping that that would be one fund. fund. So I just think it might be useful for the council to find capitulation because if you're going to make or more funding, and if you're going to make the, the shared prosperity fund, it would be useful perhaps for you to know. Well, see before you even go into the difficulties of trade and how you get access and the implications of a border and all of that. But this is what you're going to use as a council. What's going to come in to uh, to your council from Europe, and it might be just something worth asking other councils: Have they been able to encapsulate that and how that was done? It's something that we'll definitely take on board, but I think it's being very speculative and based on an assumption that these funds are going to be replaced. And I do not know how you would even quantify it at this stage. It's I think it's impossible to even try and quantify because if you're talking about Peace Four and SEUPB funding, who knows? You know, um, it's 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 all hinging on what sort of a Brexit deal you get in five weeks if you get a deal at all. And I think the time that you would spend on trying to quantify this figure would be enormous. But I do take your point. Okay, it's just, it's just going to strengthen because peace funding is going to perhaps continue. But there would be an understanding in the departments of how many farmers there are in your constituency, how many get single pound payment, payment, how much money comes in. I mean, because there's audit done of all of this money, it doesn't just fall out of the sky. So it comes in, goes to councils, councils maybe administrate some of it, um, others goes directly to individuals, others apply from competitive funding streams. So there would be an understanding of what councils receive and it might be useful to try to delve into that because you're not making this up. This is going to go whatever about what's going to happen at the 70 or in, in 76 days' time. We're losing European funding. That's gone. But it would be useful for every council rather than after the effect you're going, oh, my God, that we didn't realise that on top of all the other problems we have, this is the kind of of funding stream that's going to be lost for your your area. That will yep. be important information for you to make a case for your area to secure the kind of funding that you're going to use as a consequence of that. I do take your point in that, but uh, I would, uh, conversely, I would also say that, that uh, single farm payments would be up to the individual farmer and council couldn't quantify into that what we were going to lose and it wouldn't directly come into council either. So I, I do take your point and we will converse with other councils to see if there's any rationale behind it that we, we could actually um, uh, put in place um, a resource to look at that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we're going to uh, Trevor Clark. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Robert and Clifford, for your presentation. I, I think in terms of the presentation you have provided uh, via pr prior to the meeting has been useful, um, and even in your presentation today, but it's interesting, the, di the difficulty we all have, and I, and I think you've laid it out well uh, in terms of how you've done that today, Robert, it's the unknowns and the knowns and the not unknowns, and I, and I think it's a difficult position, but I I'm taking one point that Clifford has said where Clifford referred to food labelling and stuff. And whilst we're not in the position to say what that looks like, 
Um, has it clever had any information to say that if we don't have this right for the 1st of January, that there's going to be penalties? Because I would assume that the penalties won't flow if we're not ready by the 1st of January. Chair, no, no indication, uh, no indication of penalties at, at this stage. And I know there have been a lot of uh, a lot of discussions, and there are um, there are arrangements in in place. So you know th there there has been progress. I suppose it's it's all dependent on whether a negotiated deal is in place and whether the labelling requirements as they stand continue, or uh, if they become null and void if a, a a deal isn't in place. So it's 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 a bit of the uncertainty. Um, my point, I suppose, in, in terms of the, the queries that businesses have raised with us is, well, can we go ahead and print a large number of these labels and, and get our documentation in place? And I suppose the advice we're giving at the moment and, and um, you know, keeping in touch with colleagues in DERA to get the, the most up-to-date advice that we can is that, look, as it stands at the moment, yes, um, the, uh, the arrangements do seem to be uh, in place, but don't go too far ahead and, and bulk buy or have the, the, the uh, a large amount of the documentation with the uh, identification marks in place, because if things do change, then you will have, um, you'll have, uh, I suppose, undergone that expenditure unnecessarily. And so I'd like to add then, Clifford, in relation to what your advice to them is, I think that's the right advice. And I, I suppose if you go back to my question, given that there's been no uh, information to suggest that if you aren't ready, that you're going to be penalised, I think to actually tell people, hold off, let's wait, because there is no urgency to do this just yet, because we don't know what this position looks like. And, and I think from that, whilst that's not necessarily reassuring for people, I think the advice that your council is giving out to tell people to hold off till we see actually what we require is the right advice. Um, I, I think then if I listen to what... Uh, Martina has said in terms of her questions, of course, Martina never comes back to say that given the amount of money we put into Europe, that there is an opportunity that, of course, that the UK government could set up similar schemes themselves directly. And, of course, it would be much more efficient because the net benefit to Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK would be much greater than keeping the bureaucratic uh, EU government in, in its position. I mean, we all round this table, while some would hate to admit it, we have continually given more to Europe than we ever got back. So it would be useful whenever, and I'm sure we're all hopeful in terms of the UK government, that, uh, and they've never been bad to us in the past in terms of funding. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I, I can hear a member laughing here, but um, more than one. So, some of her members have done very well over the last few months. They think they got an extra £10,000 from the local government here. I that they shouldn't the have got. But, but ultimately, the, the finance will follow. I mean, I, I am hopeful that the government will uh, continue to make that commitment, bearing in mind that they have the same problems within their own constituencies right across the rest of the UK. You get 10000 I'm not quite sure if there was a question in that their um, deliberation, but if there's nothing to answer, we can move on then to Trevor Lunn. The other Trevor, yeah. The other Trevor. Um, thanks for your presentation, gentlemen. Um, have you done any assessment, or is it possible to do any assessment as to the financial pressure that this will put on the Council, given the current lack of clarity? I mean, that's maybe not a fair question, but you must have done some preparatory work. And also, have you, have you um, received any indication of what uh, financial assistance may come from central government to cover those costs? Sure, I think you should hear those before we would, to be perfectly honest, um, and I don't think there's anything that's come out. And you're dealing with so many unknowns that this council could not be in a position to put any quantitative figure on these. Um, no one knows, uh, as, as, as Trevor Clark alluded to, there are the British government going to put in um, a like-for-like -like replacement for single farm payments? Are they going to put schemes in that will compensate for peace and SEUPB funded schemes? Until you actually know what what is coming, how do you quantify what you're going to lose? You could do a whole raft of stuff and lose nothing or gain something. So I don't see it would be prudent for this council to spend its time doing that. Yeah, I'm more thinking of the actual cost of running the council. You see, you're going to have to perhaps uh, lend some environmental health officers to other, other bodies by the sound of it. Is, uh, can you assume that you'll be compensated for that? Well, until you, until you know what you're actually going to be... Uh, asked to do. I suppose you can't put a figure on that. Um, it is the un unknowns and it's it's a point that's been made right across the UK. Brexit's done. It's not changing. Whether you like it or not, it is what it is. But it's not. It's the uncertainty of not knowing the, the deal. Is there going to be a border? Is there going to be checks? And and I'd say from Clifford from the EHO's department, I don't know. Clifford, have you done any um, sort of 
modeling around to see what assistance you would have to put in? Uh, well, Chair, it's a, a constant uh, balancing act, I suppose, at the, the moment, not least with the, the pressures that we're facing during the, uh, the current pandemic. But I have to say we are working closely with other uh, departments in London. For example, the Office of Product Safety and Standards is providing £600,000 uh, worth of funding for the 11 councils to assist with preparations for uh, non-food products uh, that may be impacted. So, again... Um, Time is of the essence. The more information we can get at the minute and see what available funding is there, it makes the planning and the the uh, the be making the best use of the, the the resources that we have. But you know, it's always been uh, a balancing act and making sure that we address the priorities as they uh, as they arise. Yeah, well, thanks for that. I must say, Chair, that it's very difficult to form a sentence these days without saying unknown or clarity or time is of the essence. And <laughs> you've proved that again. I sympathise with you. You know. But thanks for your answer. Hey, thank, thank you for, for, for those questions and thank you to, to Robert and Clifford for the presentation. And um, whilst it, it may be deeply frustrating that a lot of our sentences are going to include no, unknowns and not having clarity and not knowing what's going forward, I think part of this exercise is actually trying to find those common themes that there are amongst all of the councils for us to be able to articulate that through um, to the executive here and uh, through there over to, to London and down to Dublin so that people realise that we can't be dealing with unknowns and that the, the coal face is actually dealing in unknowns and that is just not, not much use and, and is not much help. Um, and if that is the only message that comes out of this process, I think it's still a fairly relevant and fairly strong uh, message to send. But um, to, to Robert Clifford, thank you very much for coming along. Thank you for being the first uh, in the firing line. We really appreciate that. Um, and thank you. And, and good luck with the preparations going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK. I want to just move us on fairly quickly onto the next round. I think we're having a few potentially technical problems with Belfast City Council in terms of getting video. But we certainly oh, we have them there. Oh, we do? Even better. That's, that's yeah. just itself out. Um, that's excellent. So um, we have uh, along from Belfast City Council, we have Councillor Anthony Flynn, who is the chair of the Brexit Committee. And we have John Walsh, who's the City Solicitor and Director of Legal and Civic Services. Um, gentlemen, you're very welcome. Thank you for making yourselves available to us today um, to have a conversation about the impact of Brexit upon the Council. Um, have you maybe got a few words to say first and then we'll move into question and answer? Yeah. Well, then we'll, we'll just pass over to yourselves then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you to the committee as well for holding this uh, meeting today. So, as you've heard, uh, my name is Councillor Anthony Flynn and I represent the Ormiston DEA of Belfast City Council and I'm a member of the Green Party in Northern Ireland. Um, I also have with me John Walsh, who's our Director of Legal and Civic Services. So I'll spend, uh, we'll spend a couple of minutes here going through an initial um, introduction and then, of course, we'll open up to questions. So um, the Belfast City Council Brexit team undertook a Brexit readiness review exercise in October 2020, following on from an earlier review, uh, earlier review carried out last year from, the from when the transition period began. There are a number of potentially significant issues and themes stemming from a no free trade deal with the EU that we have identified. These issues range from significant concerns at the Port of Belfast. As you will be aware, members of the Council undertakes a number of checks on goods entering Northern Ireland, such as, fish, such as checks on fishery products and other consignments. We have also identified concerns with potential higher basic costs of running everyday Council services and higher costs on fuel to run our fleet, as well as a number of other issues, which I will mention in greater detail. While the Department of Agriculture has secured UK, UK government funding to design and build the new inspection facilities required to carry out um, SPS checks at the, uh, the Port of Belfast, these new facilities are planned on the assumption that the EU will agree significantly reduced levels of checks on GB the NI imports. If the EU doesn't agree reduced checks, then the development of these facilities will need to be upscaled significantly as they will not be ready by the 1st of uh, January, end of the, of the transition period. And the department is currently considering contingency arrangements for this scenario. The, the Cabinet Office recently uh, published its worst case scenario, which 
uh, stated that 40 to 70 percent of trucks traveling to the EU might not be ready for new border controls. Members, clarity is needed in terms of plans to manage such a scenario to ensure that trade is not adversely impacted and to avoid unnecessary delays at the ports. As the outcome is anticipated, or as this outcome is anticipated, greater clarity is needed on these contingency arrangements to ensure trade is not adversely impacted, as I've said, and to avoid delays at the ports of entry. Members, even if and when these facilities are built and ready to go, without clarity over the level of checks required by Belfast City Council, we may not have sufficient staffing levels to carry out these checks. Members, to date, the Council has recruited a number of additional officers to carry out extra checks, and we are currently undergoing a second recruitment exercise to fill the vacant posts. However, it is under our understanding and expectation that the Food Standards Agency intend to bid for funding to cover Council staffing costs for the next three years. However, these staff may need to be upscaled if the EU do not agree to reduce the level of checks. Members, it is essential that councils are fully funded for the implementation of checks required under the Northern Ireland Protocol, either through cost recovery or through government grants. Given the degree of uncertainty at this stage, it is essential that funding is flexible and it, and it can be upscaled if costs exceed estimates. Clarity is required over longer term funding. Members, other identified risks for council services include higher basic costs and additional costs on supply chains, such as providing sufficient specialised food products for animals at Belfast Zoo, the impact on staffing levels with the reduction of EU migration, the impact on costs of running our council fleet under potential higher fuel costs and costs of replacement components to maintain the fleet. Members, the impact on supply chains and higher costs identified by the Council may impact on our Council reserves if costs cannot be, recovered on, uh, cannot be covered under existing budgets. We require clarity on potential funding streams from central government to help cover these ad additional costs. Members, I have alluded to potential higher costs on everyday services and the issues identified under those higher costs. However, it cannot be understated the potential impact on vulnerable people and repairs of the council area who may face higher everyday costs of living. Belfast City Council has been working in partnership with DFC and community partners to deliver relief and support communities throughout the pandemic. And our models have been successful in delivering support such as food distribution and the development of the community hub. However, clarity is needed on future funding from the executive to allow us to continue supporting communities as the transition period comes to an end and a potential higher uh, cost of living kicks in. And I'll, I'll move on uh, over to John Walsh, who's going to cover some other identified risks. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Members. Um, the City has shown the admirable resilience to the pandemic, but all sectors have been significantly impacted. Payment count has risen by 134.9% uh, from October last year. Footfall within the city centre varies between 11.7 to 58.7 of normal levels, and the footfall level was identified as the slowest of recovering cities in the UK. And these figures give an indication of the challenges that lie ahead. The challenges of preparing for Brexit are clearly made much more difficult by the current circumstances. The potential for increased costs, however, arising may have a significant impact on consumer and investor confidence with a correlating impact on our rate base and in turn our ability to deliver our, our ambitions for growth, our ability to support and grow capacity in communities, to sustain our growth in tourism and hospitality sectors and small businesses which outside of the public service are our main sources of employment. In the context of COVID, it almost seems that Brexit has become a bit of a sideshow, but the reality is that meeting the challenges of both pose a massive issue for government, businesses and people. So just speaking about some specific Belfast issues, Belfast is significantly reliant on the visitor economy. One key subsector is business tourism. The Council recognised this through its £29 million investment in the Waterfront Conference Centre. The events industry pre-COVID reported ongoing challenges as a result of the uncertainty created by the Brexit decision. Given that events are generally planned at least three to four years ahead, they reported that event organisers were concerned with the lack of certainty as to what this would mean in terms of hosting an event in the UK. As a result of this, the city lost out on uh, uh, quite a amount of business. 
The visitor economy sustains around 18,000 jobs in Belfast, and any developments that put this in jeopardy will have a significant impact on the local economy. It is important that we seek to re-establish our position in this market. Belfast is a service-based economy, in particular hospitality and retail. There have been concerns expressed as part of the ongoing trade negotiations that some major food producers in particular may pull out of NI. Um, therefore, um, because of the additional requirements associated with doing business here, this may have a fundamental impact on the city's retail destination as it may affect our offer in speciality or unique goods or produce. Concerns have also been expressed in terms of increased costs, making the city a less attractive proposition for tourists, whether they be from um, the Republic of Ireland or further afield. And in this context, our visitor attraction, which is part of our city team, is very important in terms of that enhanced and unique offer. One of the key drivers of the economy in Belfast is financial services. The Financial Times has named Belfast as number one city globally for financial technology. We are also Europe's top, top destination for new software development projects and the number one city globally for US investment in, in cybersecurity. It is essential that we retain access to the EU financial services market if we are to retain this competitive advantage. Belfast is predominantly a micro business economy. More than 90% of the businesses in the city employ 50 people or less. These small and uh, micro um, businesses are particularly vulnerable to significant changes in trading requirements that may come about as a result of Brexit. They don't have access to resources, both human and financial, to work through those issues. We need to provide additional support to help them through this process. Despite these challenges, I perceive a continuing positive interest in investing in the city, which is recognised as the regional driver for the economy. Therefore, it is important to continue this positive momentum by ensuring strategic investment in the sectors that can sustain economic growth with real reach in terms of our citizens and initiatives with the capacity to be multiple problem solvers. The city remains an attractive proposition for investment with comparatively low value, uh, land values and investment costs and the availability of skilled, educated and talented people. The city deal and its digital innovation program points the way in terms of high strategic alignment of public and private investment and partnership working between councils, government, universities and the private sector can achieve positive outcomes and identify and address deficits in the market. The digital skills for UK economy report identified that 72% of large companies and 49% of SMEs are suffering technology related gaps. The city deal approach is the same approach that should be taken in respect of future funding opportunities, including the Shared Prosperity Fund. Whilst the approach to be taken is not finally sound, it is important that the level of funding is at least equivalent um, to that which would have been received through uh, ESF, ERDF and other funds. So it's important that the UK government is faithful to its approach in terms of levelling up uh, and a sound case can be made for Northern Ireland in terms of future funding. Northern Ireland's productivity is lower than the UK average. GVA in Northern Ireland is around 76% of the UK average. NI has the lowest uh, business startup rate of all UK regions. Our long-term unemployment rate is significantly higher than the equivalent UK rate. Economic activity remains one of the greatest challenges. NI has the highest rate of people between 16 and 24 who are not in education, employment or training. Councils should have a role and work in partnership in co-designing the way in which SPF is allocated and managed. Priorities should be identified by assessment of need and there should be alignment in terms of sub-regional policies and the program for government. The principle of outcomes-based accountability should apply in respect of these projects. There should be no prescription around capital and revenue and they, they should target investment in skills, business support, infrastructure and education. In this way, SPF presents an opportunity not only to reduce bureaucracy, but to provide much needed flexibility in terms of how funds are applied. With this, we should also consider our risk appetite. Post-local government reform, with a reduction in the number of councils to 11, there is the ability for councils to take on more responsibility under SPF. Therefore, the ability to work collaboratively with central government is much more realistic, as evidenced by the city team. SPF should align with and support other strategic opportunities and sources of finance. In short, we believe that the role SPF can play in economic development can complement emergency emerging strategies of the executive. 
in the development program for government, we believe the type of approach suggested can make SPF very effective. And we also have to look at the other opportunities that may arise. I know that there's a lot of discussion currently around innovation funding, so we need to be able to exploit those opportunities in terms of levelling up as well. So thank you, Chair. I think that would uh, conclude our submission to you today. Okay, thanks very much indeed for that uh, comprehensive report. That's appreciated, and, and I suppose just the nature of having to get as many people as possible uh, in today. There's only a short period of time, so um, apologies that there's only a, a short window for questions. Um, one maybe question, just that something just to pick up, um, Anthony, something that you had said. And this is obviously through no fault of your own, but are you as a council finding yourself in a position where you are having to employ staff to carry out checks whenever you're in the scenario of not knowing where the funding is going to come from long term for those positions and you don't know yet what it is that they're actually going to have to check? Um, yes, you're right, Chair. That, that is a position that we have at the minute. So we have, as I said, um, started off a recruitment process for additional um, uh, members of environmental health to be able to carry out those additional checks. But, you know, like I've said, we, we are not completely aware of the full level of checks that we will have to carry out. We're operating at the minute under the assumption that the EU will be quite lax in some of the checks that they're going to require um, on, on our officers. But again, we, we don't have that clarity yet. And as I've said already, um, that funding for those uh, staffing levels will need to be upscaled if and when uh, we know what the final arrangement is going to be. Um, and is, is there anything else John you want to add to that? No, I think the position that you've stated is correct. I mean, the current funding allocation, I think, is for one year, but very much the report coming back to us from officers is that uh, it's very much unknown as to whether or not what they have will, in fact, be adequate to carry out the, the level of checks that are required. Thank you. I'm going to pass on to Pat Sheehan. OK, thanks for that, Anthony and John. Uh, I just, you, you might have mentioned it. I, I uh, might have missed it. Did you give a, a, a figure, uh, an exact figure, for the amount of funding, direct funding, from the EU that Belfast City Council will lose as a result of Brexit? Some figures in terms of um, ERDF, there have been um, um, 194 uh, approvals, and um, that represents 241, uh, just over 241 million pounds in terms of grant approved. And in its respect of uh, ESF, um, there were 84 approved projects, and the uh, investment uh, uh, totaled uh, just over 240 million. So, and that's actually added to the increased costs that are, are going to accrue. What, what's the total figure? Do you know? Uh, these are figures that I just, uh, you'll have to forgive me, I only just got these figures just before um, the committee commenced. So, um, the total, are you looking for the total in terms of all of the, the council's spend by area? Yeah. So, in total, uh, for uh, ESF, it's 315 million, just over. And uh, in respect of ERDF, the total is 350, just over 355 million. Okay, thanks for Thank you. Um, any dog can be is uh, Trevor, do you want to yeah. come in? And then I'll go to the ones that are on the phone. Uh, oh, I don't mind if somebody else. No, no go ahead, go ahead. Thanks, gentlemen, for your presentation. Um, I'm looking at the report and the comments about labour migration and the effect on the events industry, and presumably the hospitality industry, and even the health service. Uh, anecdotally, I, I would have heard that there has been an exodus of foreign labour from Northern Ireland ever since the Brexit decision was taken. So have you noticed that accelerating, or do you anticipate it might accelerate as a result of the final uh, departure from EU? Or do you have any figures in terms of uh, anything to back up the, the notion that perhaps we're already in a crisis as far as foreign labour is concerned? That's before you talk about the COVID-19. 
don't have the actual uh, figures. We do anticipate that there could be f uh, future difficulties in terms of uh, market demand, in terms of um, the attractiveness of the city, in terms of some of those people who would have come and chosen to make this place their home. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I just follow on from that, um, Anthony and John? Thank you for that. So really, really good, actually. Um, but just on the back of what, what you've just been asked there, um, I had a meeting with mayors who deal with the, the um, asylum seekers, and the vast majority of them clearly find themselves in, in Belfast as the, as the hub. Uh, I know this is a home office um, issue, but um, they've said that there's been a, a, the largest increase of asylum seekers into Northern Ireland and hence into Belfast in the last six months and there has been over the last 10 years. Uh, have you looked at if that is, it was likely to increase and the pressures it's likely to bring onto um, uh, Belfast and the council in general, um, if that trend of increase um, carries on? Sure, I don't, I don't have those details to hand, but I'm happy to provide the information to the member in terms of uh, a view based on um, whatever information is available to um, our officers at a later date. Okay, and I guess the point is that there, there seems to be a two-way move of people maybe leaving this, the people who can who can work who are leaving, and the people who are coming in, the asylum seekers who aren't allowed to work into Belfast. So the, there seems to be a really unbalanced sort of flow leading up to to the end of the transition period. But thank you. There's certainly a sense of some of those people who want to work, particularly in the hospitality sector, um, leaving. Okay. Um, Martina, I, I can't see you to, to see if you would wish to ask a question, but there's a couple of minutes left if you wanted to ask something there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Um, I can see all of you. Um, I just want to pick up on the, um, on the funding that you mentioned with regards to the European Social Fund, the ESF, and the European Regional Development Fund, the RDF. Because my calculation from the figures you read out, that was 670 million. I also know that you have, um, well, you had, anyway, I don't know if she's still there, fantastic um, official called Laura Leonard, uh, who was known throughout Europe to pull down European funding, independent funding streams, which was not then dedicated to that you spoke about. And I know that Belfast City Council was among the best councils of securing European funding. So it's just to ask you a bit about the, that kind of funding stream as well, because contrary to what some people have said earlier, you know, we are a net beneficiary from the EU and we are set to lose more than, than what we put in. But I just from trying to get a sense from council to council, um, like the 670 million that Pat um, was able to gather from his questioning. On top of that, you have, I know there's millions was drawn down by your council um, I was quite jealous for Daring Strabane Council wanting them to follow the lead from you at times because you did it really well. So I'm wondering, have you assessed that and what impact it's going to have on the council? Yeah, well, Laura um, was excellent and there was another officer who also was tasked with the um, with uh, looking at whether or not um, other funding opportunities were available in the context of Europe as well. So we were um, quite successful in, term, in terms of that. Um, to be honest with you, I mean, um, in terms of where we find ourselves in terms of COVID at the moment, I mean, really, we haven't sat down and carried out the type of analysis that you suggest, Martina, but uh, it's certainly something that we will need to look at going forward. And um, particularly, we will need to look at you know how we access funding in terms of driving our green agenda. And some of that money, for me, is also looking at I mean you know look at how we can apply that in a way that it can be a, a multiple problem solver. Yeah, well, I, I, again, because we're having to tap into um, a British fund that has yet to be defined, although it's been promised um, in relation to the north. That, uh, that, that we'd be able to draw down funding from there. Given that you've already done a calculation, you're quite ahead and it's right, but we have only 57 days left to go uh, before the end of this transition. And whatever about the future relationship deal, the funding element is gone, will be gone. So it would be, I would recommend to build on what the work you've done. You've done sterling work, been able to give us those figures that you've done today but you might want to reflect on that so that you can encapsulate the the entire 
and damage that is going to be done to your council through the loss of European funding and therefore that would make your case when going forward, I would suggest. It's important that there are full negotiations with the UK government and particularly in the context of the principle of levelling up that we at least uh, retain what we would have got through European funding. I, but I think in terms of where we're at, uh, and for all the reasons that I said that I outlined in terms of the presentation I made to you, there's a case for actually enhanced level of funding coming here. Yeah, I agree. Um, thank you very much. Um, look, the, the time has, has run out. Um, gentlemen, th thank you very much for that presentation. I think we're meeting with each one of the councils uh, this week and next week, and I think that each council is going to have its own um, particular focus, and I think it's fairly um, strong message coming from yourselves there, the issue of the amount of funding that there is um, that's levered in uh, to Belfast City from uh, the European Union, and just with the, 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 the clock ticking, that lack of surety uh, about funding is obviously creating a difficulty, and I think you've put it excellently in the context that we're facing COVID and the pandemic. Um, and I suppose Belfast is one of those places with its concentration of businesses and uh, commercial uh, properties that is going to be impacted by any downturn that there is on the high street is going to severely impact um, your sales there in terms of your rate base. So there are two very uh, big competing um, issues there that are going to drain finances and there needs to be assurances going forward. So we will certainly make sure that those views are articulated through to the executive and the governments as part of the Brexit process. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you very much, thank you. And thank you to, to the committee as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, members, we'll move on to our um, next presentation, which is uh, from neighbouring council from uh, Lisburn and Castlereagh um, City Council. We have from there, we have the mayor, uh, Councillor Nicholas Trimble, and the chief executive officer, David Burns. You're both very welcome uh, today. Thank you very much for making yourselves available to give us some information on uh, your council area and the impact of Brexit. If you're happy enough, we'll pass over to yourselves uh, to give us a presentation for a few minutes and then we'll move into a question and answer session. Okay, well, thank you, Chair. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Can indeed, yeah. yes. That's brilliant. Well, no, well, well uh, Chair has said thank you very much uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to address your committee uh, today uh, to discuss the impact that the exit is going to have on our local government. Um, as obviously as we prepare to, uh, ourselves to deal with that and what that's going to mean. Um, we should already have the uh, written submission that we've sent in advance. Uh, but I think it's fair to say, as we're navigating towards um, a post-EU future, our council certainly is very keen to map out a way forward that will allow us to play a full part in working for citizens, um, using our unique position to support our businesses and our communities, we are very keen to help them take advantage of the new arrangements uh, in new, innovative and exciting ways to support a growing and prosperous economy in Northern Ireland. Uh, but that's not without its challenges. Uh, as might be expected uh, by the biggest change in social policy in 40 years, there are indeed challenges ahead. Uh, but I don't want to take the time today to just outline what we see as the difficulties that we're going to face. What I also want to do is to highlight how local government can play a key role in addressing this very new and unknown environment in ways that are going to hopefully benefit all of us. So since uh, June 2016 and the referendum, local government has been busy building strong relationships with our partners uh, across departments. Um, it's a process that has, in fairness, recently been accelerated uh, by our joint efforts to deal with the current COVID pandemic. But in developing these relationships, all sides have come to realise just how much greater the impact the public sector can have when all aspects of our local, our regional and our national government work together. By allowing each of us to play to our strengths, I feel that we present a truly coherent and cohesive team that can make real and positive life changes, ensuring that no group is left behind. Now, Progress, I feel, is being made, but if we are to thrive and take full advantage of the new environment, 
then we must build on this and develop a platform that is seen as being you know best in class to make change on this scale work we in effect need your help in embedding a system-wide change across all decision-making bodies in government now if and should co-design as a as an approach be embedded in policy development then a pathway to the real and meaningful involvement of all stakeholders, I believe, will be opened. It is councils uh, as champions of localism who are best placed to reach communities, to reach our vulnerable groupings and our families and individuals who ultimately, it's their views, collectively inform the decisions that we make for all of our futures. And this approach works both ways. Um, if you'll allow me to give you one example to illustrate what I mean. Uh, if you cast your mind back earlier this year, the work undertaken by councils earlier in the year to de uh, in delivering food parcels to our elderly and to our vulnerable residents, I think it demonstrated just how quickly uh, we can deliver right down to the individual level, whilst at the same time supporting government policy and objectives. Now, to make this happen, uh, we cannot afford to neglect the ways in which we communicate. As I stated uh, earlier, a start has been made, but if we are to construct a system that allows co-design to flourish, then I feel councils must be seen as equal partners and treated as such. Now, it's good that structures are already in place that allow us to communicate to a degree and I don't think it would be difficult to build on these existing structures together. And I urge you as a committee not to miss this opportunity to synchronize and in effect synergize our efforts for the good of all of us. Now, I'm sure many of you or all of you will know that typically uh, at council level through our annual estimates process and through the collection of rates, we collect the funding which we require to deliver the services for the incoming year and a great deal of effort goes into ensuring that only the absolute minimum amount required to deliver for our citizens is asked for and collected. Now, since March of this year, councils have been forced to focus at times almost exclusively to the response uh, for COVID-19. And this second wave has ensured local government as a whole will continue to deal with that response phase for some time to come. Consequently, what that means is there's limited resources that are available at short notice to prepare and to position local government for the impacts the end of the transition period will bring. And you know very well that mobilization of new teams can take time. And I would ask that the committee be aware of such challenges as we approach the end of this transition period. So as members of the committee uh, will already have noted, from our submitted report, uh, we attempt to set out some of the challenges that currently exist uh, that restrict the ability of councils to play a full and important role. Now, the committee, however, should be aware uh, of LCCC's commitment to supporting a successful transition and building a positive future for all citizens in Northern Ireland. Uh, in our submission, we've highlighted six key areas of concern uh, to the committee, which centre pretty much on the following points. First and foremostly, the movement of goods and services to and from Northern Ireland and the impact change will have on traders and on trade itself. Secondly, the impact on the economy at large and what that's going to mean for the sustainability of council funding in the longer term. Thirdly, the demands for council services and how we develop to meet the challenges to come in areas such as environmental health, planning, economic development, etc. And fourthly and finally, replacing uh, the funding programmes that have existed up till now that have come from the EU. Now, overshadowing all of those issues, there are still a number of key points that add to the difficulty uh, for planning for this new environment that we're going to face come 2021. That, I feel, can be sort of summarised firstly by the uncertainty that we're going to face. It's not yet clear, it's not yet guaranteed or certain that there's going to exist a deal 
that will allow a free trade between the EU markets and the UK. And the government has yet to provide clear-cut guidance on many of the most important areas, such as trade, uh, enforcement activities, procurement of goods and services, and reciprocal arrangements. Secondly, the clarity. Uh, there's even in areas that are better developed, it's just not clear to us how the new arrangements are going to affect councils, what additional services that we're going to have to provide, and how those additional duties are going to be funded. Thirdly, it's that partnership working. And as I said earlier, although some progress has been made in recent years, establishing the links and building relationships between departments and local government, the need, I believe, to develop a true partnership of equals through co-design and participatory working remains. And finally, shared vision. Local governments, I think it's fair to say, can do things that departments cannot. Uh, our reach and our local knowledge is invaluable. Government resources, when partnered with the, the council help, uh, uh, can be properly focused. They can do so much more than either organization can do by ourselves. Um, much work remains to be completed before this becomes a full reality. That really comes to the end of the presentation, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you for your time and uh, the committee's time. And both the Chief Executive, David Burns, and I are here and happy to take any questions that you may have. So thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, um, Nicholas, for that, that presentation. Um, maybe if I could start by, you discussed at the start how um, there's been some sort of interdepartmental or are you joining and working with various departments and agencies somewhat in response to coronavirus, but that being a good measure for maybe dealing with things from Brexit. Could you give us a flavour maybe just of how you and uh, maybe David maybe would give us a, an answer as well about how involved you as a council feel in the whole process of Brexit in terms of, I mean, are you finding out information by, by going on to Twitter and Facebook and newspapers or is there regular circulars been sent through to you to give you updates as to what is happening? I mean, do you feel that you're getting enough information and that your views are being sought as to, to what's taking place and shaping for the future? Thank you, Chair. I'll maybe kick off and then Mr Mayor can maybe join in thereafter. Um, I suppose this time last year uh, we were working very closely with the, the departments, Chair, and uh, the departments had committed to supporting local government through the identification of a, a link officer uh, reporting in through SOLAS uh, to sit on the NI hub as the local government response. Uh, however, when COVID kicked off, that officer who's employed by Lisbon and Castlereagh City Council uh, was brought back to deal with our COVID response. Um, things dried up uh, within the departments, and it's only very recently that that started to uh, kick back online. So uh, Solace is working across all councils just now to identify an officer to take that forward. So there, there is means of communication there. Um, however, things have been very quiet on the back of COVID. And, and just the worry just now is how close we are to the, the end of the transition period. Um, and still the amount of uncertainty that the Mayor mentioned uh, still existing. So if, if, if I, sorry, could I <clears throat> supplement just to say that I think uh, what the Chief said is 100%, but it's the, uh, the, the outworkings of COVID. Uh, yes, I think all frustrations were at their max uh, at that time because we were just being so reactionary, but I think it has shown that the, those lines of communication have proven vital because we wouldn't have been able to to manage COVID in this in the way that we have done to date. Uh, so it's really about building that uh, in terms of capacity, both at our end and on and on uh, de departmental level as well. Yeah, and and I suppose I know we had a similar scenario where there was a reference to. Um, the suggestion that one of the senior officers within the department was drafted away from dealing with with Brexit to deal with COVID issues, and it does just kind of it, it sparks in my head is was there not the capacity to appoint another officer and have one dealing with COVID and one dealing with Brexit? Because invariably, when they remove back from dealing with COVID, they're now sitting in a scenario with 50 days and, and, and Brexit, and, and we're only starting to focus on that workload now. And I think that that would have been something that the department via that hub should have looked at 
much earlier and said, could we have two officers and one dealing with, with each issue? Because, I mean, if there's only a handful of days left, I mean, obviously, you're going to feel very disempowered in terms of the ability to co-design what's going to be happening from, from January onwards, because, you know, it, it's nearly too late to prepare things. So it's going to be just about communication rather than co-design at this stage. Would, would that be fair to say? I think communication is crucial in all this, Chair. Um, I think there still is an element of co-design that can happen because I think we all feel as if we'll fall over an edge, a cliff edge on the 1st of January, but there's so many things we'll take a period of time to work through. My concern of just this sort of pushing out of communication is that through COVID, um, there was so many lessons learned where departments did make errors that they could have avoided doing uh, in terms of drafting legislation and the like if they had listened to and involved a uh, local government as a key partner in that process. Okay, okay. Well, that's that's certainly good to, to be able to report that back in, in terms of being a positive experience and to maintain that. Um, Trevor, Don, you're looking to come in? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Hello, hello. David. <laughs> You can say hello back. <laughs> uh, okay, that's not awkward. Moving on. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, th thanks for the presentation, strangers. Um, I, I, one of the, some of the things that Lisburn Castle Ray Council does very well is economic development. First of all, they've always been very active. Uh, support for community groups, uh, voluntary groups, and also the community planning exercise you're now engaged in and some of that depends on EU funding. How, how confident are you that you can continue the same level in those areas of activity after the January the 1st? Uh, thank you for that, Trevor, and it's great to see you. I'm glad you're keeping well. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just in terms of economic development and the like, we do have a strong offering down here, and certainly uh, community planning is something I've been really keen uh, to put front and centre of everything we're doing. Uh, and you're right, Trevor, just in terms of Peace Plus and interreg monies and the like, I mean, uh, in our submission, uh, you'll see there's £230 million of funding has come to uh, councils over the past six years. Um, and it, it, is a big, it is a big risk and a gap for our communities in that a number of them rely on that for delivery of their programmes. Uh, even as we talk about shared pr prosperity funding alike or any replacement through Peace Plus, you're possibly talking 12 to 18 months before such a scheme could be up and running. So th th there's a risk that people who have been employed in these projects, and also for us as a council, the project managers, the programme officers, we will lose those skills as they're going to uh, seek jobs elsewhere. So even should a, a new scheme come on board in 12 months' time, I may well have lost the skills and experience with which to run something quickly uh, off the back of that. So needing that sort of continuity and consistency really would help. OK, uh, thanks for that. OK. Um, Doug Beating? Yeah, just, just very quickly. Um, first of all, thanks, uh, Nicholas. Good to see you and, and, and David for, for that presentation. I thought it was really good. And, I, you know, I'm just reading it again, uh, your written submission, and it's just full of the words clarity, guidance uh, and assurance. Uh, and I'm just getting the sense that the information is just not getting down to you at all as to what's going on. I've certainly seen here that you're saying, you know, what is going to be the outcome if there is a no deal transition period and it's not getting down to you and it's something it's something that we as a committee um, have harped on um, pushing upwards to try and find out you know who's doing the planning here do you have anything in place to do at local level any planning if there is not going to be uh, a, a there's going to be a no deal outcome at the end of the transition period Uh, Mr Mayor, are you happy enough for me to take that? Yeah, yeah David. Uh, Doug, thanks for the question there. Um, just in terms of all of the planning we've been doing, we've been taking a very much a risk-based approach to this. So we have business continuity plans specific to Brexit, uh, which at least allows us to think about uh, reasonable worst-case scenarios and how we would then uh, adapt to that. Now, when you add that into uh, COVID and the sort of various troubles we're facing there, 
uh, we're going to have quite a lot of work on our plate, uh, irrespective of what happens uh, come the, the, the 1st of January. Um, so we have presented that to our members on a regular basis to keep them in, in, the, in the loop as to our risk register position. Uh, and we will just have to try and adapt as need be. But certainly, as far as a council, uh, as far as we are concerned, is critical and essential services come first. And that's about keeping the council's services on the road and supporting our communities and our local economy. So irrespective of whether it's COVID or Brexit, uh, that will be our, our critical uh, focus. Could I just supplement uh, and say, uh, hi, Doug, good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for the question. But it, uh, it's, it's fair to say that council is limited in the scope of what we can do. And certainly what was evidenced throughout the whole COVID pandemic is that we were able to uh, synergize with uh, d departments very well in trying to signpost because we, we were the first point of call for people contacting us seeking help um, you know in terms of businesses and what how do they uh, survive if that communication isn't there uh, if that clarity isn't there you know filtering down to us we're going to find ourselves in a sticky wicket when people come to us again as the first port of call come Brexit uh, and seeking guidance what they can do uh, just to sort of highlight the, the, the difficulty there, I was in a conversation earlier uh, with one of the, the, the managers of one of the, our big haulage companies in the area, and uh, he's at his wit's end in a sense because they, they have about 100 border crossings, both north, south and east, west uh, every day, uh, but it's the groupage they have, it's 20, 20 consignments on average per, per lorry load, so there's 2,000 consignments per day, and uh, okay, there's uh, the North Iron Protocol may cover them in terms of the um, the clearance costs going forward and immediately, but the administrative side is going to completely knock them for six. And I, I'm just not sure that council has the capacity to be able to assist on that level. It really has to flow down, I believe, you know, from Stormont. And I'm getting the sense, Nicholas, is that there's there's a real just a drip feed of information coming down to you from Stormont, and and if that's the say if that's the case with you, it's going to be the same with all councils, and that is you're just not getting the information. That's really useful. So thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, okay. Um, we have George and Martina on the um, Starleaf system as well, and about two minutes left. Is there either that would have a question that they want to ask? Okay, that's that's fine. Just sorry about that. Just we, we can't see them on our system here to see if they're indicating to speak. So, gentlemen, thank thank you very much indeed for the um the the presentation. Certainly highlighting again for a number of key issues that we'll be wanting to include uh, in in any report that we make on these meetings about the the synergy and the working together of of. Um, regional and local government and how they can complement and help each other and that there's good practice already in existence through the response to COVID and how that might be able to um, sort of be uh, assimilated across to try and help with um, Brexit changes that may come in at, in short notice. Um, so that's definitely something that's been picked up from, from your presentation. So thank you very much indeed and um, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, okay. Yep, and members, we're just going to take a few minutes break then, just as we've reached the halfway. Um, so we'll just give people a comfort break of uh, just maybe 10 minutes. Okay, members, we'll uh, make a start again uh, to the second part of this afternoon's meeting. Uh, we're continuing with representations from various councils, and the next council is Mid Ulster. District Council, and we have Councillor Dominic Malloy, who's the chair of the Brexit Committee, and Mark Kelso, who is the director of Public Health and Infrastructure. Uh, gentlemen, you're very welcome to our committee meeting. Thank you for uh, making yourselves available to uh, update us on the impact of Brexit upon your council area and what the priorities are. We have a number of members present in the room and two members present on the Starleaf system alongside yourselves there. And if you're happy, we'll just let yourselves give us a few minutes of a presentation just to detail to us what the issues are. And then we will um, ask a few questions after that. And have we got Dominic or Mark available there? 
Yes, sure. Thank you. Oh, excellent. That's great. Okay, we'll pass over you. Maybe having a slight technical problem that we can't see you, but that might rectify. But we can hear you. So if you want to continue, start with your uh, presentation, we'll certainly be able to hear each other. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks to the committee for giving us the opportunity to present and raise our concerns uh, today. Uh, as a council, we have formally presented to uh, the Shannon Select Committee uh, and to the European Parliament as part of the Border Corridor delegation. So we welcome the opportunity today to present to yourselves. Um, concerns of Middles to Council as a local authority, primarily around the, we, the briefing paper that was submitted, uh, identified the implications for environmental health checks. Uh, monitoring, certification, and enforcement. Um, the concerns around waste management process and the implications for loss of EU programmes and the implications for business in the area. And I suppose, like many councils of business across the island, uh, our concerns hinge around the three interactive fronts north south on the island, east west, and our relationship with Britain, and directly to and from the European landmass. Um, through the workings of the Brexit working group here and engagement with the business community, we identified a, a number of areas of concern. And I'm not going to rehash what has already been said around the, the loss of EU support programmes, but EU programmes have helped immensely, particularly in this area in the last 10 years. I've invested in our people through education, infrastructure, shared space, sport, tourism, agriculture, business development. And whilst there has been some commitments to extension on some funding streams, Extensions are short term only, and with no commitment for future renewals, this will impact the Council's ability to deliver on future programmes. There's absolutely no doubt on this. But the bigger picture will be uh, to the wider community in the area, uh, particularly around Southwest College and their, and their delivery of programmes, uh, our agriculture sector and our, our business sector. We have three major sectors of industry in, in the district. Um, Engineering and manufacturing. Uh, these are invest NI figures of 1.5 billion pounds of sales, which counts for around 20% of the local economy, supplying 40% of the world's handling and quarrying equipment. We have construction with sales of 1.2 billion, and agri, agri food sector of just under a billion pounds. Mm. Home to some of the major players in food processing and supplying of short life products. I myself work in the industry, so I'm well aware of the implications of um, supplying products to Britain, Europe, and beyond. Um, and there are major concerns that delays due to increased certification, custom checks at several points, will have an, an immediate negative effect. The supply chain around these fact sectors alone amounts to thousands of jobs. And hundreds of millions to the local economy. Uh, a study by the Centre of Progressive Policy has reported that Mid Ulster will endure the greatest impact of COVID 19 in the north, with a possible loss of 45% GVA. We have the highest regional percentage per head of entrepreneurship, with 94% of business owned locally. Many of these are SMEs and are poorly prepared for Brexit. And whilst there has been a lot of publicity around marine fishing, I want to highlight the challenges faced by Loch Ness fishing in particular and the struggle of the Loch Ness island industry. It is recognised by the EU with PGA status. So we need to ensure the protection of that status and the market both inwards and for glass eels to supplement the natural supply from the Sargasso Sea and export as over 80% go to Holland and Germany. But the big message is lack of clarity for, for our local businesses. There is a lot of information out there with very little clarity. And I think the last gasp kind of arrangements around negotiations and, and agreement has added to that. In terms of infrastructure, there are numerous border crossings between South Tyrone and North Monaghan. We have three major arterial routes which carry cross-border traffic, the A5, A4, A29, urgently require major upgrading and modernisation. Energy supply is curtailing industrial de development, and the completion of the North-South interconnector is also urgently required before we start to lose business. Of course, we are nothing without our most important resource, our people. Our workforce, our ratepayers, our tourists, our consumers, present and future. There are major concerns around the effects of Brexit on the ability 
of people to move freely to work on both sides of the border. We have a large migrant workforce and there must be the ability of these people to travel to and from Europe and beyond with minimum restrictions. Many are already experiencing issues around passport renewal, travel, visiting relatives and citizenship. We cannot under, under, understate the impact of a restricted labour market. We have 10,000 migrant workers. Minimum value sal annual salary levies are going to impact on that supply of labour. Chair, thank you very much. That ends May. And I know Mark will come in with some detail around um, figures, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Okay, we're passing to yourself, Mark. Chair, uh, no, I was. Uh, um, I think the presentation that today has, has, has been given, the, as regards, I know there's been previous questions about uh, figures of funding. Um, uh, in Mid Ulster, um, we have uh, attracted almost £20 million of funding in the period of 2016 to 2021. Um, uh, £1 million of ERDF funding, uh, £10 million for RDP, uh, 3.3 for peace and 5.1 for um, construction SEEP uh, funding programmes. So that's where we are at present. Okay, th thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'll ask just a couple of questions. And um, it's not that we're selecting what may seem like the less obvious issues, but obviously we've had three presentations. So some of the issues about lack of clarity and lack of knowledge going forward, we've already covered some of them um, in, in some detail. But I was interested just to hear, Dominic, you mentioned there about um, waste management, which obviously I know for, for councils can be quite a, uh, an expensive business and quite a, a big part of the work that is done uh, and obviously reaching certain targets etc uh, is a critical amount of the work. So just sort of what, what impact do you think that there will be uh, from Brexit upon the sort of waste management side of the council business? Well, Thanks Jeremy, Jeremy, yeah. I yeah. yeah, Mark. Um, Mark's our, our, our director of environmental services. Okay, okay uh, chair. And uh, just in regards to the waste issues, yes, certainly. Um, given we are we have a land border, and obviously we are in contract uh, with a number of uh, major uh, waste processors in Northern Ireland. I understand that they have an all Ireland business. Um, they move waste uh, uh, from the north to the south uh, for various processing. Uh, uh, arrangements. Um, so there is a concern that if uh, in the event of uh, no deal arrangements that um, various charges could be applied to the waste uh, transfer process and obviously that would fall back on councils then uh, because the, the, the waste uh, operator will never uh, uh, obviously take on additional costs without trying to transfer that um, back to, to council. Um, there is also the potential for uh, wider tariffs um, on uh, secondary uh, recycled products, etc., that are, are a byproduct of the waste stream. Um, and uh, there's, obviously, there's obviously some concern uh, in regards to that. There's also the issue of uh, workers uh, that we do have that are uh, moving across the border on a, on a daily basis uh, for work, um, and uh, the whole issue of um, the, val the validity of the, the license and the, and the uh, the driving license process. So there's there's a number of concerns as regards that. Okay, and just you said, touched upon obviously it, it, sort of Mid Ulster would be sort of well, well known for having that large migrant workforce. Um, have you had many interactions or uh, um, discussions with businesses about the potential impacts that there might be if that migrant workforce was to be? Um, subject to the additional rules which could cause problems and, and even do you see a role for councils in maybe helping and assisting that migrant population to help uh, facilitate any paperwork or rules that are to help those people and assure them that, that they can stay and can carry out the work that they're doing? Uh, just in regards to the the whole issue of uh, migrant workers, obviously the 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 nature of Mid Ulster with its very large manufacturing base, um, we employ uh, well over seventeen thousand uh, people in manufacturing in Mid Ulster. A big part of that workforce is the migrant uh, is the migrant community, 
um, and there is significant concerns on the, long, the longevity of their their, their stay um, and whether uh, those businesses will be able to, to call upon that, that level of workforce going forward and also the concerns that's already been raised by the chair in regards to um, the level, um, the bar that will be placed for any new um, migrant uh, uh, who wish to wish to move to Mid Ulster area um, in the event of uh, further uh, work opportunities. So there is significant concerns around the whole issue. Um, we understand that 10,000 have over 10,000 have now registered in the Mid Ulster area, and we're very pleased uh, in, re in regards to that. Um, but there is still a lot of uncertainty around that area, that issue. And whenever you say that you're aware that 10, I mean, do you have any direct interaction with any of the government agencies in terms of being able to, or is that just something that you're picking up from elsewhere about there being 10,000 that are registered, or do you have some sort of work or input into that process? Well, I mean, certainly the council has been uh, working closely with uh, a number of community organisations who have been leading locally uh, and engaging with. Um, uh, the migrant uh, population uh, step uh, in the Ulster being uh, one of the key organisations that uh, it works very closely with the migrant community and with their own community teams. But I know the formal registration process has been led by by central government, and certainly those are the formal figures that we got. We asked for those figures um, just uh, at the end of last week uh, through Invest and I colleagues, and uh, those are the statutory figures we've been presented with. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass now to Emma Sheeran. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Mark and Dominic, for the presentation. Other um, members in the room today have referred to Mid Ulster as the best managed uh, district in the north, and I wouldn't argue with that. Um, just, just in terms of uh, the presentation, and again, I suppose that the point has been made and remade that there is a lack of clarity on all of these issues, and we're all aware that the British government hasn't been sort of forthcoming uh, with answers and as we approach the deadline people are worried. Um, I know you referred there to EU structural uh, funds and the, the fact that RDP uh, was worth £10 million to Mid Ulster in I think a five year period. Now I should declare an interest. I'm a social partner on the RDP lag board for Mid Ulster and I know that the um, aim figure for 2019-20 or 2020-21 was 980 something 100,000. So the, the impact of that on the ground has been massive in terms of the community groups and the, the play groups and the GA clubs and all, all of the different organisations that have benefited from that. How confident are you um, as a council that there will be a replacement for that funding from the British government? Thanks, Emma. I would say we're totally unconfident um, that there'll be any kind of like-for-like -like replacement. Um, there is, there's... Uh, a lot of ambiguity there is there any promises or, or definites around that so we're hanging by by the thread or on the the rdp programs would be hanging by a thread uh, without some some clarity and guarantees that the uh, like for like funding would be would be placed that will have a major impact on on our communities as you know that money filters down right throughout the, the district so it does and some of the projects um, that have come come through that have delivered immense um, not only for the well-being of the community you know for the economy as well and to lose that would be severe detriment yes yeah, just to say that uh, and following on from that the the council delivered um, you know a, a local capital program for over 44 villages and settlements in mid Ulster over this past um, uh, three four years um, to the value of about three and a half million pounds and every settlement in mid Ulster um, has um, benefited from that program so we'd be very concerned uh, about any, uh, the funding interventions going forward no I just I concur with, with everything you're saying and I suppose it's just we want to get some answers going forward and that's the concern and thank but thank you okay um, Trevor Lund yeah thanks uh, hello Dominic uh, Mark um, you, you mentioned, I think it was Dominic mentioned in the presentation about the level of success, spectacular success that Mid Ulster has in terms of production of heavy machinery, quarry plant, and so on. I know that that's been a long term thing with the companies you have up there. Um, what, what, what proportion of that goes to export? Maybe you can't tell me off the top of your head, and how much goes perhaps to the UK and then to Europe specifically? 
And would it make sure, yeah, we, you know, Marcus, some figures there that he may be able to refer to. Um, a large, large percent of that would, would be export. Um, yes, the quarrying industry here would have, would have some impact on it, um, but a large pro proportion of that would be exported. Um, just, you know, Mark referred to the, the migrant labor workforce. Um, the expansion of, the, of that industry, um, the migrant labor workforce has been part and, you know, part and parcel and, and center of that. So they have um, a lot of companies wouldn't have been able to um, expand in the way that they did without that, that, that labor coming in. Yeah, just, just to come back to the figures there that's been requested, certainly in the Mid-Ost area uh, in the year 2019, um, um, external sales were to the value of £3 billion. Um, and um, the export of that was, the export uh, percentage was £1.3 uh, So a sizable proportion of the manufacturing basin at mid Oster does go um, um, to export. And uh, that's a major concern for us um, as regards the way the new systems will be put in place. Um, and we understand that the uh, new software systems, the trader support systems, have only uh, recently um, come to fruition. Um, we know the government have um, invested heavily or proposing to invest heavily into that process, but we're now less than eight weeks away uh, from D-Day and the system hasn't been tested or trialled. Um, we have uh, large manufacturing companies that need to get product out of the country, uh, and we have to have assurances that those systems will be fit for purpose, and those companies need to have those assurances as well. And certainly we're not getting any indication that that is there at this moment in time. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, 1.3 billion went to export. Is, is that the European export, or does that include what would go to the rest of the UK? I can't, uh, I wouldn't just have the breakdown of that figure any further, uh, Chair Members, just uh, certainly we can get that uh, certainly for the committee. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the rest of it then, the 1.7 billion that's left would, would be used locally, sold locally, mainly to the quarry industry, is that correct? Those are those are generic figures for all the manufacturing business, so that would be um, both uh, food manufacturing and uh, uh, engineering um, uh, as well, so uh, those figures would be in the round. Um, the uh, I think the a lot of the obviously the food manufacturing side um, over 50% um, of the uh, uh, sales is obviously going straight through um, uh, to UK mainland. So we do have um, obviously um, we can get further uh, detailed information on that. Uh, Chair Members, that's what's required. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Uh, it would be an absolute tragedy if that was interfered with, but I hope things go well for you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, and uh, we're going to move to uh, Martina, who's on Starleaf there, to um, ask a question. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Dominic and Mark, for the presentation and the information that you, that you brought forward. And um, as you have said, we're only eight weeks away. And notwithstanding the importance of the, the British market, as you had outlined, it's north, south, and east, west. But when I was looking at the figures from north to south, the EU and the rest of the world, it all comes together through access to the EU of 11.2 billion. And then from the north to Britain, uh, being 10.6 billion. I'm wondering on top of what you had mentioned, um, if you would have time, not today, obviously, but before the eight week period to be looking at um, the access that's going to be lost by yourselves, particularly in the, uh, the business that you are involved in uh, or the manufacturing industry in your area to the 60 um, FTAs they, in, in the EU, you know, because not alone will you have a, a loss and an impact of Brexit. We know it's a disaster. We know that it was going to have an impact one way or the other, and those who promoted it should have known that too. But regardless of what's happened, the North's going to lose access to the 60 free trade agreements that the EU has with other parts of the world and um, has consideration by being given, not by yourselves only, but by council 
And then when you talked about the 10,000 migrant workers, you know, the uh, discriminatory point-based immigration system, and that's going to devastate sectors like agriculture. Um, I mean, how is that going to be managed given that this is the new immigration system that has been bought in? Because despite the all that you're saying about the lack of clarity and other councils are saying that it's, it's, it's the same, rightly so, there's a lack of clarity, as Emma Sheeran has said, in the executive office because the British government is the negotiator and they're not sharing that with neither here nor with Scotland or anywhere else. Thank you, Martina. Yeah, the, the, those those are major concerns are in that the, those uh, trade agreements and the the lack of closure um, to have them settled, um, the the loss of 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 those, particularly to the the uh, telehandling and the quarried equipment and the the aircraft uh, supply base um, would have a major impact. Um, we we had asked that, that we would ask that the. Department of the uh, Economy would would re-engage with um, Oxford Economics to uh, to review the the district the impact on the district um, both now and for for the future you know not just in the next 12 to 24 months that we're looking yeah. 10 years down the line we we have <clears throat> sorry excuse me we have a uh, one one positive from other that our migrant base has largely settled a lot a lot have settled now we have a lot of um, migration back to to their home countries, to Poland and Lithuania, Portugal, um, but a large percentage have settled in in this area um, and have settled well um, and integrated well, and we're now seeing second generation um, of those families coming through. Um, but it's that uh, base that that unknown that will travel back um, if things get tough, if jobs are lost. Um, that those families will operate again and, and move on. Can I ask, Chair, just one, one final question about that? Because a common travel area only applies, as we know, to British and Irish and not to anyone else. So have they been able to put in for and apply for settlement status? Um, has there been any help for them to do that? Because even though they have settled and you said, thankfully, they've made it, this place their home and we want them to stay, but we want them to stay, so uh, we need to make sure that um, that this new immigration policy is not going to result in them being forced yeah. out of here. There, there has been engagement with local companies have have tried to engage with their workforce, um, but it's largely ad hoc. You know, it, it is hit and miss, um, and the smaller and medium enterprises that haven't got a dedicated team to put to that. Um, to look after and engage with their workforce and say, have you applied for the settlement status? It hasn't been done. And, and a lot of them are not aware of the implications of not having gone through the processes, unfortunately. Okay, Chair Disaster, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, um, thank you for that. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for um, your presentation. It's given us a, certainly a uh, uh, enlightenment to just the issues that are impacting you there in, in Red Ulster and, and the issues that are quite unique to yourselves. I would certainly include those within um, the present or the, the what we will be putting together in the report after this. But we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Much appreciated, Chair, and um, appreciate the committee. Um, if there's any more information that we can send to, um, we're ready to do so. Okay, that's grand. Thank you very Indeed, much. Right. Okay, we'll just take 10 seconds. Ik krijg het niks. Wel klink filmd, dat melk. <laughs> Oké. Okay. So, we can move on to our uh, next council area, which is Darien Straban District Council. Um, we have, along from there, we have Councillor Brian Tierney, who is the Mayor. And we also have John Kelpa, who is the Chief Executive Officer. Hopefully we have both uh, on the Starleaf system. Okay, indeed, you're uh, very welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for 
uh, coming along to give us a presentation today and to discuss the issues that are impacting uh, Derry and Straban area with Brexit just around the corner. Um, if you just want to take a few moments, maybe just to detail to us some of the issues that you think that there are um, and the issues that you're facing, and then we'll just open it up to members for a few questions after that. Okay, Chairman, thank you very much. And can I take this opportunity on behalf of uh, indeed Derry City and Saban District Council, all of our people across our council area and all of our businesses to thank yourself and the committee members for inviting us along to this very important uh, Brexit stakeholder event. Chair, Derry City and Saban District Council area has a resident population of around 150,000 um, and a wider reach within the northwest region of approximately over 350,000 many of whom crisscross the border on a daily basis to access employment, education, health and retail services. This long-standing history of, of social and economic co connectivity within the cross-border Northwest region is reflected in the present social fabric of both jurisdictions. The Derry City and Scrabant District Council population poses the highest percentage of Republic of Ireland-born residents living in Northern Ireland, amounting to just under 7,000 people which is about 5% of our population, while correspondingly half of those who, who were born in Northern Ireland and are resident in the Republic of Ireland live in Donegal, which is about 13,000, about 8% of the population of Donegal. Such connections are even more prevalent within the Donegal border settlements located about five kilometres outside of Derry, such as Calais, Bridgend, Muff and Burnfoot. Half of their po present population were born in Derry amounting to around 3,000 individuals who have strong family and other links to their birthplace. And while lower house prices initially attracted these Derry City and Straban District Council residents to move to Donegal, their relocation was further accelerated by the absence of any significant administrative barriers to living in Donegal, with the ability to commute quickly and unfettered to our council area to access employment. While the volume of those crossing the border varies, across three major routes um, and border crossings of Bunkrana Road, Colmore and Straban in the northwest. The scale and magnitude of the cross-border travel is evident, with, with Derry and Donegal traffic reaching 300,000 journeys per week within Donegal. 98% of their border crossings commute into Derry or, and or Donegal. In fact, over 60% of all cross-border movements between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland take place along these three routes within the Derry City and Strabane District Council area. Chair, turning to specific sectors, research conducted as part of our preparations for Brexit showed that a quarter of those employed in health in the Derry City and Strabane District Council area were resident in the Republic of Ireland, while similar pattern, patterns of employment in local government educate. And to understand the situation fully, it is worth noting that some firms in Donegal report that almost 50% of their workforce are Northern Ireland residents. And while many firms in the Derry City and Stavon District Council area report significant percentage of staff that live in Donegal. And while official figures show that in, in terms of employment, approximately 7% of the staff are in export oriented firms, anecdotal evidence would suggest that, the vast on, that this is vastly underestimated with many firms providing trade services right across the border region, not least in the area of construction, building maintenance, um, few of which obviously would appear on official data, Chair. Um, Chair, with your indulgence at this point, I'm going to hand over to our Chief Executive, John Kelpie, uh, to, to take us through the next part. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Members. Um, the economy of the Derry City and Strabane District Council area grew at a relatively low rate in, in 2019 of only around 0.3 percent um, as did the population while there's been some employment growth our rate is still amongst the lowest in northern ireland with continuing high rates of economic uh, activity and activity and unemployment as a remedy um, to our relatively poor economic performance and indicators the council and its city and district partners developed and agreed in 2017 a fully inclusive strategic growth plan. That's essentially our community plan. It sets out an ambitious and comprehensive way forward for the region in terms of economic development, the environment, and social and community well-being. 
Mr. Chair, very much progress has been made to date on the objectives of this plan, but much more needs to be done, and there needs to be much more of a focus on delivery of the big, key strategic economic projects within the plan, and that requires um, the collaboration and cooperation of both governments for this cross-border region. The ERSI uh, October estimates forecast that growth in the Republic of Ireland will fall by a half in the event of a no-deal Brexit scenario, and as half of our city region is in the Republic of Ireland, you can see the potential consequence that that will have on the city and county economy. And while there's been a tremendous variation in the forecasts for Brexit impact in Northern Ireland and the Northwest in particular, there's still a consensus among most economists that in the long run, it will depress economic activity here in the on this side of the border in Derry City and Strabane District Council, and that we will see um, less than 2,000 additional jobs created. To date, the North West has benefited significantly, um, like other council areas, from a range of EU peace programmes with investments over the decade, all sorts of ESF programmes, ERDF programmes, project uh, capital project programmes, to the tune of more than £80 million pounds over a seven-year period from 2007 to 2013. It's essential that good business and other relations, relationships between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland are critical for both of our economies and for our societies to grow as we leave the European Union, as indeed are the maintenance of extensive east-west trading and supply chain connections with Britain. Only by strengthening these east-west east and these north-south relationships can a border area such as ours reach our full potential and deliver on our strategic growth plan target. This Council's objective is to move away from being a low growth economy. The objective of the wider northwest region is to be a solution-focused place, a place of growth and innovation, a platform for multi-jurisdictional cooperation and collaboration, enabling both parts of this city region to become net contributors to the respective economies. Derry City and Strabane District Council welcomes the commitment by the UK, the EU and the ROI, guaranteeing that there is unfettered access by Northern Ireland to, bo to both ROI and GB markets, ensuring that there is minimum disruption to these very important commercial relationships within whatever new dispensation arrives. And hand it back to you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, John. Um, Chair, given how beneficial EU programmes have been in fostering economic growth and safeguarding peace, particularly in the most disadvantaged areas, such as the Dairy City and Strabane District Council and in Donegal, it's critical. It's critically important that Northern Ireland has continued access through some agreed mechanism to European support programmes, such as Peace Plus and Erasmus, and any substitutes for the ERDF, either by the UK or the EU government. And additionally, existing and forthcoming challenges, such as those posed by climate change, require a coordinated response, more particularly where these issues cross existing jurisdictional borders. Again, if we are to fully address the transition to green energy, then this can only be effectively achieved from an all island approach. We must therefore work collaboratively um, to ensure that mechanisms remain to, to guarantee continued joint working to maximise the benefits of all across these islands. And to do all of these things, we must ensure that our region is open for business whenever the, that orientates and continues to do so after December 2020, at the end of the transitional period, and, and that the EU structural and other funds continue to flow to more disadvantaged regions. Importantly, also improve levels of education and skills will be a fundamental in addressing the challenges that new comparative Brexit markets environment presents. And for all of us in the Northwest, in pursuit of the objective that the Northwest region plans sustainable expansion to our third level provision in line with the commitments by both governments contained within the new decade new approach agreement. Post Brexit, the furtherance of the vision requires even closer cooperation. Much coordinated responses are fully integrated, co-working by all partners. The successful delivery of the Graduate Entry Medical School at the McGee campus provides 
both a demonstration of what can be achieved through close working and a useful template for further development, especially the delivery of university expansion, again as promised in the, North, in the New Decade New Approach Agreement by both governments. It is only through further development of our existing relationships on a north-south, east-west basis that the Dairy City and Stoban District Council will be able to maximise the sustainable benefits occurring from our City Deal and Inclusive Future Fund of 10,000 new jobs and more than doubling our economic growth rate. It should be noted that Northern Ireland, UK and the Republic of Ireland will all benefit from this investment in our futures, but it is key to its success, successful achievement that we will be promised unfettered access to markets within the withdrawal agreement and a willingness by all parties, but particularly the UK and the EU, to put in place measures we have called for to mitigate the inevitable dis disruptive effect that our moving to a new chapter, a new environment will generate. So, Chair, in summary, um, in order to sustain sustainable growth and prosper and to address and meet existing future challenges, the people and the businesses of our cross-border region in the Northwest require unfettered access to GB, Republic of Ireland and the, EU, the wider EU. Continued and further opportunities to develop our region through an el eligible and participation in existing and emerging support programmes from both the UK and the EU. And further multi-jurisdictional cooperation at national, regional and local levels to address the key strategic issues facing the Northwest cross-border area in relation to third level education and university provision, infrastructure, jobs creation, investment and climate change. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, th thank you very much for, for that presentation, giving us a, a flavour of the, the issues that will be faced um, up in the, the Northwest. And, and I suppose um, once the realisation of the impact of Brexit became a reality. I, I think much of the eyes of Europe, if not the world, looked at, at the North and then zoomed in on places like Derry and Newry um, as, as large settlements were half of the hinterland and areas surrounding them uh, are within the two jurisdictions and therefore potentially subjected to two uh, different sets of rules and, and to all of the the tariffs and, and problems and paperwork that goes alongside uh, the, the exit process. And you had mentioned in your presentation there about the research that you had prepared and the research that you had done working with businesses. And I, I was maybe keen to, to, to sort of determine, maybe not, not so much the issues, because I think the issues over time have been articulated and, and are, are being pushed out, but it's to get a sense of... Do you feel that the businesses within your area have been listened to, that their views and their worries and their concerns have been taken on board and that any of the concerns that they have are being addressed? And is there a flow of communication, be it from uh, British government or now through um, Stormont government, through the executive, given that it's now in place for the past year? Do you feel that the businesses within uh, your area have, have been part of the process or... Do you feel that they still are facing an uncertain future? Mayor, do you want me to take yeah. that one? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you wish. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I suppose you, you would get a variable answer to that question, depending on which business um, you would ask. Um, I, I would say um, in this region, it's probably um, relatively unique in that many of our businesses, because their staff uh, straddle the border and the mayor's given some statistics in relation to that, and indeed some of their products crisscross the border um, um, while they're in production, are probably receiving advice um, from three sources, the Irish government, the European Union, and the UK government or Northern Ireland executive. Um, so I think the, the queries that we would hear mostly from our businesses is that um, they have multiple sources of information and at times those sources of information um, are not necessarily consistent, um, nor um, do they get the same information at the same time. So I think that's a, a variable response to that. And, and I think there's a, a, a unique requirement um, for businesses in the border area that there's a joined up message um, that comes forward from them 
and, and, a, and a responsibility that both governments would work and, and the council is very willing to play a part in this. Indeed, both of our councils, Donegal County Council and Darien Straban District Council, who work very closely together um, to aid in communicating that message um, to businesses. So I, I, would, I would say today, in response to your question, Chair, that that would certainly be something that would improve the situation dramatically. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll just jump straight to my, my other question, which is we, we've had a number of councils indicate to us about the impact of funding um, you know, through peace monies and, and, and other structural support programmes. But could you give us a flavour of what level of uncertainty there is within the employed sector, um, as in the people that are employed as a result of these funding streams? Um, just, you know, are they getting sort of confirmation that that funding will continue into next year in various sectors and therefore their, their jobs will, will continue. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm acutely aware that you mentioned 80 million over seven years, you know, so 11, 12 million pounds per year is a, is a big driver of funds, which is probably on top of quite a considerable amount of people that are gaining employment out of that. Even within your own council, you're, you will have many officers that are funded by um, you know, uh, funding streams for the delivery of peace programmes and others where the funding comes from Europe. So just to, can you give us a sense of just that, that funding and um, employment sector uh, below European funding and, and what certainty and there is for them? Well, um, I think just from my perspective and perhaps the mayor would like to come in as well, Chair, in this, um, I, I, I caught the tail end of the discussion with Mid Ulster and um, we would certainly be in a, in a very similar position here. Um, with regard to that um, funding, it's probably um, heavily split, heavily leaning towards uh, project funding, but also programme funding. Um, from both perspectives, um, there is a significant amount uh, um, issue with regard to employment and opportunity and we have no guarantee at this stage that that funding uh, will continue other than the broad statements by um, UK government that um, alternative funding arrangements will be in place but at this stage we have we have no detail of that and we're particularly concerned as a council um, that many of these current commitments um, there might be an expectation that somehow uh, council uh, may be able to um, provide for them, which of course, given the challenges on councils at this moment in time is, is an impossible ask. So it's a very uncertain position at this moment in time, both in terms of programme funding and also major project funding, um, which clearly also has a huge impact on jobs and employment. And maybe just g g given the where we are in terms of being just a number of weeks before the, the 1st of January. I mean, does that mean that many of these projects and, and, and indeed public sector organisations that employ through these various streams, I mean, are we at protected notice stage yet for these em employees or is it just a case of hoping that some form of funding will come in place come 1st of January? Well, I think sure, we're certainly into that territory. Uh, many of these organisations will um, will be well experienced in dealing with um, the vagaries of, of, of funding maybe um, not being confirmed till the last minute uh, and have issues on an annual or on a three yearly basis with regard to that. Um, and to some extent, I think some of the current issues that we're facing with regard to COVID um, have, have, have maybe taken the attention away from um, the medium term issues, people are so focused on dealing with the short term. But I certainly think that once we pass through Christmas and come out into January, that the realism of all of this um, will, will dawn and there will be significant issues associated with it. I don't know, Mayor, if you wanted to add to that. Well, thanks, John. And, and I, I think you're right, and Chair, um, I suppose um, from, from my perspective, the to tie your three questions um, together and give you, a, a, I suppose, a joint response. It, it's my belief that there, there's not enough information coming out um, from um, any of the of the governments in relation to how we're supposed to move forward. Um, you've pointed out that we're we're eight weeks away um, from the end of the of the transition period, and I think 
Um, as John has pointed out, a lot of our people are so focused and uh, uh, we fully appreciate that the governments are also focused on, on battling COVID. But we, we have another um, crisis, potential crisis coming down the line um, in terms of, of a sustainable or a substantial amount of funding. Um, and, and we don't know if that if funding is going to be in place coming to the new year and if it is where it's going to be coming from. So I think what would is key for the governments is to get that information out as quickly as possible because at the end of the day, this is people's jobs um, that, that, that they're wandering under, under the, the Christmas period, not knowing um, whether they're going to be in position um, come the new year. Thank, thank you for those uh, answers. I'm going to pass now to Martina, who is on Starleaf, I'm sure, given from, from there that she would have gone ahead there, Martina, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, and thank you to the Chief Executive. Um, I know uh, personally the kind of work and research that Darian Donegal has done, and I know the kind of lobbying and influence that you had uh, in Europe before before we were kicked out of the EU. Um, I think that, you know, when I was listening to you talking about the percentage of people who live across the, the Northwest, not recognising the, the border, the Partitions Ireland, when you consider the cancer services that we have, in Anthony Gavin Hospital came about because of the critical mass of, of the Northwest. And it's one thing that I feel we may need to be starting to give attention to, given that the talk is at times, particularly as the days go by, that there could be a crash out in relation to the future relationship. So the, the import of the radio isotopes that are used um, particularly for, for cancer patients, for diagnosis uh, and treatment, uh, for that kind of, for people who are in, uh, in Anthony Gavin Hospital, you know, that's going to be dependent on the kind of future relationship that we have. And we know that the British government then may find it harder um, to guarantee a supply chain uh, after leaving. So given the concerns that we would have in Derry, I'm wondering, um, if there's been any engagements with yourself, um, with, for instance, the BMA and others, because I know they have expressed concerns about that particular matter. Chair, you talked about the um, level of funding and you quoted the, the 80 million over that EU tranche. We also have the Peace Bridge, the Science Park, Science Park, you know, big statements that, uh, that we were able to secure European funding for that will be lost and that they're, they're scattered all over there. Uh, projects like that, that has been able to avail of, uh, of European funding. And uh, just to, to say to the mayor, because uh, I would say you would probably uh, know this, Brian, yourself, that given it is the British government who is leading these negotiations, they go into the tunnel, they go into the engagements with the EU, um, all of us are trying, are desperately trying to get some kind of clarity, and the clock is ticking. But in the preparation work, I think that Darian Straban has already done, and the connectivity between yourself. If I could end with what kind of engagement has taken place with the British government or the Irish government around the five hundred million shared future fund, because that's going to be important for areas like Darian Donegal not just for projects, but for people and for supply chains. And I say, you know, we need to be given a bit of attention to the issue of radioactive um, radioisotopes and the implications of that for all hospitals. But obviously we're quite concerned for, for the hospital in Derry. Mary, would you like me to open or yourself? Yeah. No, no, you go ahead, John. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. And, and, and thank you for your question and comments, uh, Martina. Um, I, think, I think you've hit the nail on the head with regard to um, the big strategic issues facing the Northwest. Um, we have a model for how they have been previously successfully delivered. And unfortunately, we also have a model um, uh, that, and, and there are many examples of where there has not been that success. Um, where it is successful, and, and this is an issue that exists in every border city 
in every country in, in the world, if not Europe, um, you must look at the functional economic area of that of that city and district. And the functional economic area of, of, of this city and district is, a, is, a, is an area that comprises, as the mayor said earlier, a population of between 350 and 400,000, half of whom live in one jurisdiction and half of whom live in the other. And if we traditionally look at how we implement big strategic initiatives on a one jurisdictional basis, then um, that will not lead to success. And the cancer unit is a prime example uh, of, when, um, of when we looked at the totality of a functional economic area and, and both governments collaborated, then it was to the benefit of the totality of the citizens in, in both areas. So the shared island unit um, provides an opportunity um, for this area and others um, to continue that work and to work uh, as a joined up multi-jurisdictional functional economic area and trying to progress some of the big key strategic projects. And in the Northwest, um, we're certainly trying to do that um, through the Northwest partnerships that have been delivered under the auspices of the North-South Ministerial Council. And we've made um, recent representations to the Shared Island Unit and indeed had an introductory meeting um, with the Shared Island Unit officials uh, just last week. And obviously it's in its early stages of, of development, um, but we've certainly laid out to them uh, the key priorities for the area um, and asked them to consider the engagement um, with the Northwest going forward. Mayor, would you like to pick up on any of those points? Yes, thank you, John, and uh, thanks, Martina, um, for, your, for your question. Um, the first point that I would, that I would make um, is, I, I know people, Martina, I'm pretty sure that you will as well, that live in Calais, Bridgend, um, and, and Muff. Those people don't say that they're from Calais, Bridgend, or Muff, they're from Derry, um, and an awful lot of them, um, it's a mindset. Um, and it never changes. Those villages are literally um, five minutes away um, from, from our main uh, city centre, and, and they genuinely believe that, and, and, and genuinely are um, dairy people. Um, and, you know, we need to make sure, and I've pointed out already the reasons, Martina, you will know them as well as I do, why those people moved to those areas. Um, it was for cheaper house prices, um, and it was the, the unfettered access um, straight back on the dairy. Um, and the letter county rules you're probably at in the city center quicker um than what you are where i am in Gallia. um and that's not an exaggeration and you will know that in relation to um our cross-border partnerships again martina you'll be aware of the work that we have done with donegal county council in relation to trying to make sure that we can get the the appropriate messaging out um around the, all of the COVID restrictions i'm sure um as an elected representative in the northwest you like i were were contacted by numerous people um, who either live in Donegal and work in Derry or vice versa and were confused at a particular point throughout the COVID pandemic because the the restrictions on either side of the border were, were completely different um, and that was very difficult for them. We very, very quickly and um, within council, myself and the mayor of Donegal County Council put out a joint video and we worked together um, to do that. I don't see any reason why Derry City and Strabane District Council um, and Donegal County Council should not be continuing those working relationships um, to further enhance uh, any funding that's becoming available for the, the, the Future Fund, for example. And those engagements, in my, in my view, should and, and will continue to make sure um, that, that, that we can build in all of the, all of the capital programmes that we have got. For example, you know, if you take the A2 Bunkrana Road, um, which I, I know uh, you'll be aware of, um, what is the point of building the A2 from Fort George to the border at Bridge End if it's not continued on out um, towards Letterkenny? Um, it, 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 effectively, it would be, in my view, a road to nowhere um, if it was to go back on the single lane carriageway um, from the border. I had the privilege, and, and you were at the meeting uh, where the, the EU ambassador um, came to Darien Straban to look around on his first visit um, and, and to walk him around our, our city's walls. Point out, pointing out to him um, all of the, the key uh, pieces of infrastructure which you um, have rightly pointed out, like the Peace Bridge, um, for example, um, the Museum of Free Dairy, um, which was funded partially by uh, the European money, um, and other key projects like that which have made, in my view, 
um, a significant change, not only to the, the, the view of our city, but the mindset of our people. Um, and I think that's also critically important. It shouldn't, it, well, it's, a, it's a key point um, that we need European um, and UK money. But we also need that money to build our people and change our mindset. And in the interest of, of reconciliation, I think that's extremely, extremely important that those monies flow to more disadvantaged areas like Derry and Donegal, um, so that our people um, can, 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 can benefit from that. Chair, can I just say, because you're, you're taking a note of this and we're doing a report, you know, as the, the city that had one of the largest um, responses to rejecting leaving the EU with 78% of the people here wanting to remain, you know, we need to start planning and preparing for an opportunity if people wanted to return to the EU. And that long-term planning and preparing uh, for that um, needs to form part of an option that is put into this paper um, as we are reporting on the, the council school. I'm not saying it's come from council at all, but I'm saying as someone who comes from the area that 78% of the people voted to leave or voted to remain in the EU, they certainly would want to stay in the EU and they would want to be given the choice at least um, if that opportunity can be taken forward and it should. Thank you both for the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Martina. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, yes, indeed, Martina, good old South Down wasn't far behind you either. I'm glad in, that, in, that, in those figures where we were very close in, in that one. But um, gentlemen, thank, thank you very much for your, your uh, contributions. Um, I mean, it really is an issue in, in areas like Derry and Uri where there's such a massive population, a massive focus of issues. We probably could take an entire afternoon to discuss for yourselves the ramifications and um, but we certainly appreciate getting a flavour of what those uh, difficulties are, uh, what, what we will have to try and face uh, in the months ahead. And we will certainly include those comments within the report that we're putting together and forwarding into the executive and to the government. So thank you very much indeed for taking time to join us today. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are uh, getting there. We're at our last council group for this afternoon's um, session and thank you members for uh, keeping more or less to the time limits we're not doing too bad we're just running a few minutes over um, and thank you for to our next two guests for uh, holding off um, and I'm waiting until now I take the opportunity to welcome representatives from Fermanagh and Oma District Council we have a uh, councillor John Coyle who is the vice chair of council and also Alison McCullough, who is the Chief Executive Officer. Um, you're both very welcome um, this afternoon, and uh, we appreciate you taking time to give us uh, your perspective on the impact of Brexit on uh, your council area. And um, maybe if we just pass over to yourselves, if you just want to take a few minutes just to explain what uh, some of those issues are, and then we can move into a sort of question and answer session with members. Yeah, um, thank you, Colin. I presume you can hear me. Yeah, um, keeping the best to last as always. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and members, and thank you for this opportunity to meet with you today. Uh, very much welcomed the chance to provide uh, you uh, with our concerns arising from the UK exit from the European Union. As you, will be, as you will appreciate, Brexit is a major issue and concern for the Fermanagh and Oma district. And uh, while I appreciate that there are different political perspectives on Brexit, the corporate position of our council uh, about the implications of Brexit is one of extreme concern. The residents of our district did not support the decision to leave the EU. The border is an uh, extricable uh, part of our district and we have received no assurances that the uh, legitimate concerns we have raised on behalf of our constituents have been progressed or uh, unfortunately even been taken, in, taken seriously. Uh, we have contacted the NIO office uh, a number of times and have just said uh, they will not meet face to face or through WebEx, that they will uh, just receive letters from us. By way of introduction, we are truly a border council. 
Our immediate neighbours are counties Donegal, Leitrim, Cavan and Monaghan. In our district, there are 132 miles out of the total of 310 miles of border. This means that approximately 43% of the NA ROA land border goes through the Fermanagh and Oma district. There are at least 85 border crossings in the council district. Uh, the 2011 census data suggests 1,300 people across uh, from our district uh, go across the border to work in the Republic, mainly in Cavan, uh, Monaghan and Donegal. Cross-border activity is a routine part of our daily lives and people from both sides of the border share access to the joint bases for the manner of day-to-day -day living, from education to healthcare, social and community activities and work. I myself live in Balik, where or which it is right on the border, and I have family ties uh, on both, you know, in Donegal, Sligo, Leitrim, uh, and the social and employment links have for generations straddled the border. In, de in December 2018, our council established an all, uh, all member Brexit committee. Since its inception, our committee has received representations from community and civic society, trade and employment organisations, cross border networks, human rights, and justice uh, campaigners. All have expressed their concern uh, for a post Brexit future. As of today, there are 52 days uh, before the end of the transition period, and it is extremely worrying that none of us know with any certainty what will happen on January 1st. We are mindful of the time and uh, that we want to engage in a discussion, but I will ask Alison to provide a brief overview on some of the issues uh, that is affecting our council and our perspective. And I'll pass to Alison. Thank you very much, Councillor, and thank you, Chair and, and members. And I'm very mindful at this stage in the proceedings that uh, many of the issues have been well rehearsed. So I'll just try and focus on, on some of the additional elements um, and maybe the unique aspects from a from Anna and Oma perspective. I suppose firstly, just to highlight some particular concerns around tourism. Um, as many of you will be aware, we operate the Marble Arch Caves Global Geopark. That's a joint project that we manage with our colleagues in Cavan County Council. It was, and uh, I suppose to some extent remains, but it was the first international geopark in the world. We are particularly concerned about the perception of a border or difficulties from a tourism perspective. We're working with our colleagues in Monaghan County Council and indeed our other partners in the Northern Councils as well regarding the Ulster Canal. Um, you mentioned the, the uh, shared island unit earlier in your, in your deliberations, and that too has been highlighted, uh, highlighted as a priority project um, for the executive. But again, practically, how are these things done post-Brexit? In terms of agriculture, um, as the, the vice chair of the council will be well aware, uh, a large number of our farmers are what would be defined as small farmers, subsistence farmers, we are particularly concerned about the impacts of Brexit on them and their funding arrangements. We're also concerned that the focus on some of the new policy relating to farming post Brexit is likely to focus very much on production rather than on environmental management. And on environmental management, um, we have a particular concern regarding the status of existing planning approvals, um, not to, to lower the tone in any way, but um, most of the planning applications, not just in our district, um, but in many other parts of Northern Ireland uh, that relate to intensive farm production, rely as part of their nitrate management plans on uh, their, their litter disposal, chicken litter, pig litter being brought across the border. Now, as we understand it from the 1st of January, that quite literally may not be allowed and there is no facility for it to happen safely. There is no clarity around how transboundary planning applications will be dealt with. There are specific statutory requirements currently on both sides of the border regarding consultation. Again, we are assuming those matters have been transposed into legislation, but we are awaiting formal clarity on that. Um, I appreciate that the committee has already discussed funding um, at some 
at some detail, but maybe just a couple of specific aspects that we would highlight from, from our perspective. Um, Peace Plus is obviously going to be a welcome development. Its remit has been expanded, but it is likely to be very heavily oversubscribed. There is still no clarity around the, the spend um, profile of that or indeed the confirmation of the full funding package. There has also been very little reference recently about the Strategic Prosperity Fund. This was really uh, as part of the Westminster governments around the levelling up agenda. There is meant to be a Northern Ireland allocation to that. Um, we hope it will be coming and coming quickly. But again, if there's anything that can be done from a committee perspective to maybe encourage some progress on that. And I suppose a specific difference between Northern Ireland and our counterparts in the in the Southern Councils um, is the business funding which has been allocated. 15 million euro has been allocated as a border enterprise development fund. That's specifically for businesses in the Southern border counties. It's being administered by Enterprise Ireland and there is nothing of a comparable scale in Northern Ireland. So I think there is a real concern that our businesses are at a competitive disadvantage, uh, particularly when, as, as Councillor Coyle has mentioned, we have so many um, immediately proximate areas along the border. There's obviously a significant deficit in infrastructure uh, west of the ban generally, but certainly on a cross-border basis. And the research that has been undertaken to date, uh, most notably by ICBAN, the Irish Central Border Area Network and endorsed by Ulster University, has shown a disproportionate impact of Brexit within the central border region, north and south. Um, in terms of the council services, I think these have already been fairly well rehearsed by, by other colleagues, but um, just to specifically highlight one of the concerns around waste management and disposal, our lorries straddle the border every day to collect waste, to dispose of it. Um, literally what happens on, on the 1st of January uh, there is certainly considerable confusion about the mechanisms that will allow that con that service to continue without any impediment. Um, similarly, in terms of environmental health, there is certainly a lot of guidance about what we expect the rules to be, but little clarity as to what it will actually involve. Um, we are concerned regarding the sustainability of existing cross-border relationships. Um, as John has mentioned in his comments, so much of our day-to-day -day activity is based on normal living across the border. There are extensive community networks that work on a cross-border basis, arts, cultural, sporting organisations. Many of those will continue and it is important that there is no, um, I suppose no real or perceived barriers to such relationships continuing in the future. Uh, another point, and, and maybe it, it ties back just to our colleagues from, from Derry City and Straban and the, the wider discussion around infrastructure, I think there is a genuine fear about what we could describe as back-to-back -back development, that Northern Ireland will take a certain development route, particularly in infrastructure, and uh, the Republic of Ireland will take a different route. Um, there has not really been proper joined-up planning on a spatial planning basis for Ireland 2040, which is the Irish government's regional planning framework, or indeed in the previous regional development strategy for Northern Ireland. Now, maybe the shared island unit could in some way assist with that work, uh, but again, it's a potential risk to us all. And I suppose just the, the final couple of comments, Chair. Um, all of our planning to date has been on the context of having a deal. We don't know what will happen if we have no deal, and the status of our own contingency plans, I think, both at local and central government uh, may be adversely inf affected because of that. And then finally, the reality is we now do have um, the perfect storm of COVID-19 impacts on businesses and on communities and potentially Brexit impacts in a very short number of weeks. And how collectively can we work together to ameliorate that situation? Okay, Chair, thank you. Alison, th thank you very much indeed for that, that, that comprehensive report. Um, I think there's absolutely uh, 
no issue or problem in the fact that many of the issues that you wish to discuss have already been raised because I think that is actually something that, that has been very useful from this afternoon's exercise is just seeing the commonality of issues um, which again allows uh, for more weight to be applied to articulating those views whenever we want to pass that message on because it's not saying that one council said this or another council said the other. We're actually going to be able to say that right across all councils have been saying the following issues uh, and that provides a great deal of weight to that argument. Um, and it is disappointing to hear that, you know, being where you are with the very unique issues that you face uh, in a very rural um, area in, in Fermanagh and Oma that the NIO wouldn't um, interact with you or, or meet you. Um, I think that's irresponsible of them, not least for the fact that they represent uh, many of the people, the ministers certainly within that department, represent the areas that, that um, caused Brexit and, and foisted upon us. Um, so it's the fact that they, that they represent almost the people that created the problem for you, but then wouldn't even uh, take the decency to meet with you um, just to hear what your views and what your concerns are. So that, that's very disappointing because I think you have a very unique voice uh, in terms of the entire Brexit process. Uh, there certainly isn't any other part of the UK that could say that they have um, that many um, land border crossings as there were and the impact that that will inevitably have on business, cultural and family uh, and community life uh, within your area and to just ignore that uh, I think is, is very irresponsible um, and maybe points to the arrogance that there often is uh, from the British government over the entire Brexit process. Um, I'm going to pass out now to members to see if there's anybody with questions. Pat? Just, just, just a quick one. Thanks, Alison and, and, and John, both, and whoever wants can pick up this question. You've taught uh, Alison in particular about contingency planning in the event of an no-deal Brexit. And have you costed that contingency planning? Uh, and presumably, if there is a cost, it's going to have to be passed on to the ratepayers and from Anna Noma Council. Thanks. We have costed, but one of the difficulties, members, is we don't fully know the extent of the contingency requirements. So um, we've mentioned uh, the, the funding loss. So from our perspective, there's roughly £25 million of funding that would have been drawn into the council. Um, that would exclude our involvement with some partner organisations. That simply cannot be replaced, um, or the scale of that funding cannot be replaced. In terms of our day-to-day -day service provision, we have certainly costed what we think is reasonable. Um, the difficulty is that the clarity has not yet been provided as to the extent of what our role will be. And that's particularly the case in relation to environmental health. Um, if we, we've seen obviously the work and indeed we've had very good support from colleagues in central government during the COVID uh, crisis the income loss to councils and what that has meant. And I would certainly have thought the contingency planning in the event of a no deal would be at least as significant as the COVID losses that we're encountering. But until we see the detail of what we have to do, it's impossible to, to fully cost it. Thanks, um, I was just I was thinking there as well, maybe Alison, John, in terms of being a, an area that, that, that's quite heavily reliant on the agricultural business, I mean, would, would you have any understand, is there many farms that actually literally straddle the border where one half of the farm is um, on one side and, and one half, the other half of the farm is on the other side? And um, just again, thinking how you know, as we move forward, that any divergence that there might be to agricultural policies will literally cause farms to, to have to decide where they're located, which field they're in of their farm as to which set of rules and guidelines they'll have to follow. Is that, is, are there examples of that in your area? Chair, I might actually d defer to Councillor Coyle on this. He will, he will certainly have the detail on this one. I know it's yeah, in a particular area of expertise of his. Yeah, well, uh, yes, there is. Uh, I don't have a complete figure, but there is a large number uh, of farmers that do farm on both sides of the border. Um, we have a number of businesses as well in our district that uh, the border runs down their premises. So on one side, they're you know in the north, 
the other they're in the south uh, yards and everything else it is going to be a nightmare and um, we don't know this is the clarity that we need for both farmers and businesses uh, you know what what do they have to do do we have to do nothing you know will there be a, you know a free trade agreement that we you know we don't have tariffs or you know what is the paperwork it is just a you know legitimate nightmare of paperwork after paperwork uh, the farming industry we are primary you know mostly primary producers uh, in Fermanagh and Oma we you know sell Weanland calves uh, on to you know the beef finishers uh, at the minute um, beef prices are holding up uh, and suckler cow uh, or suckler calves are making good uh, money but in the event of us having you know barriers east west as well as as north south uh, for our lamb and uh, pigs it is just you know it's unthinkable um you know we have our markets that we need to put out our produce to it is top class we have no questions about uh, you know sourcing of uh, the animals they are treated well they are recorded and everything is up to uh, you know eu standard and we're not going to diverge from that but um there is other you know not getting a uh, not getting a trade deal opens the doors for chlorinated chicken uh, other items like that i know that the, the dare has said that they won't do that but uh, you don't know we haven't got clarification and i think that you know it we need to know what's going to happen but farmers are at a disadvantage john i'm not a bet man but if i had to put money on the person that i would think that would get a circular cow in the minutes <laughs> of this committee it was going to go on you to be able to do that so i'll i'll throw you a tenner the next time i see you for that so well done <laughs> um you trevor you have a question yeah uh, thanks chair uh, john and alison i have to apologize i was out of the room briefly when during your presentation so i may have missed something um i just want to ask about your your tourism product uh I mean, you obviously have a terrific offer down there in terms of the boating, the walking, and the fishing in particular. Um, and I, I would assume that an awful lot of those tourists come from Europe, not, not just from the Republic, but from the European Union, because they have a big interest in from out of fish. Um, do you see any threat to that arising out of all this? And also, uh, uh, tourism equals hospitality. So. In terms of hospitality industry, how, how reliant are you as some other areas would be in terms of migrant labour? And do you see any possibility of losing some of that as a result of what's going on? Uh, I will comment on uh, people that come to, you know, from Anna and La Hern, uh, we get a lot of Europeans, uh, German and French, uh, come to fish. It is you know they have come for years um you know they keep coming back every year if they have any kind of you know a visa or if they have any kind of paperwork to do you know it just puts more cost it puts more you know work into whereas they can just book a flight fly into dublin get a you know uh, or fly into dublin or belfast come down uh, stay in our beautiful hotels in our cabins in our you know glamping pods uh, you know this is all uh, the you know important to them and we want to keep them coming because you know they love it here and we need to protect that but i might pass to Alison about uh, you know migrant workers uh, and you know in, i think it's more local uh, people that are employed in our hospitality industry yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, we would we would have some reliance, but not to the extent of other councils, maybe that have referenced other sectors. So the the relatively small percentage of um, foreign nationals would be working in the hospitality sector. There would be higher numbers working in the again the light engineering and manufacturing sector, and also in food production. Um, in terms of the the impact that we would see from the the wider tourism perspective, and I suppose the particular concern of the the tourism sector, is that so much of our product is offered on a cross border basis currently. 
So Fermanagh Lake Clans would work very closely with obviously Cavan, but the, the whole idea of the Shannon Urn water system, um, we would work very closely with, with Donegal County Council in terms of access into the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, so our natural hinterland is on a cross-border basis. Um, we've, I suppose the, the, the adages around um, tourists don't recognise borders. They typically, most of our numbers, as, as John has indicated, largely German, French and Scandinavian um, have a particular interest in the geopark as well. Mainly, the uh, main point of entrance is through Dublin. We would have a smaller percentage coming in through Belfast. And we have seen, obviously, a particular strength in the cruiser, uh, water cruiser market, uh, which again would be predominantly German visitors. The feedback that we are getting from uh, industry representatives locally is that there may not even be a border and hopefully all of the, the indications um, and the assurances we receive about uh, no impediment to travel north or south or east or west will bear out. But it is the perception of things becoming difficult ultimately determines what tourists will do. Yes, thanks for that. Well, you've, you've more confidence in the UK government than I have, frankly. But we'll see how it goes. Um, I must come and try one of your glamping pods sometimes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your answers. Uh, it was a, a, an excellent advertisement for Fermanagh there from, from John. De Trevor's eyes were lighting up with each extra <laughs> element that was being mentioned, but that's, that's very good. Um, look, we, we've reached the end of, of the question. Thank, thank you very much indeed for um, the presentation, for updating us on the issues that you face. Um, you know, we'll, we'll feed them into the report. It's, it's been a, an enlightening afternoon for each and every one of the presentations. Um, definitely being at the end was of no disadvantage, and, and we appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed to the both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. for my man Bring us up, Rekha. <laughs> okay, uh, members, that completes the, um, the, the run around the first six councils. Next week we have um, five um, councils that we in the same format. Um, we also have some other additional business next week, so if we can do as we did today and try and stick to the, the timing, we are finishing up about nine to ten minutes behind schedule, which given the, the volume of people and, and issues was was good, so we should pat ourselves on the back whenever we've stuck to the timings correctly. Um, it just leaves me to go to uh, the, any other business. Uh, oh. Yes, you can indeed, yes. Um, I just think it's outrageous what the uh, the council officials told us that the NAO refused to engage with them, and I think that is something um, that we 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 should uh, certainly get behind them and support the need for that to have happened, and the, it, it should not have been re rejected, and we should support them in the call for the NAO to engage with councils who want to be engaged. And could I also maybe suggest? Uh, chair, that we get or we ask the TO officials to be engaging with these councils because they need to make sure that these councils have the Yellow Hammer document. We heard that on two occasions when we were briefed by the TO officials that that was the document that they were using to build upon what could happen in the event of a no deal Brexit in case the councils aren't aware of that. And we should recommend that they strap themselves in when they read it because it doesn't make for good reading. Uh, uh, certainly. I mean, I think obviously we're only at a, a midpoint in terms of maybe you know, recommendations, but I think that it's obvious from what we've heard that there hasn't been that sort of interaction. So if members are happy, we could certainly at this stage, we could with a certainty know that next week we're not going to hear the opposite viewpoints to that, that we could, we could take some action on those fronts. Would members be in agreement? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so we'll write to the Northern Ireland Office and to the Secretary of State and say that uh, we're disappointed that there was no opportunity taken to interact whenever that was requested and we'll write to TEO and ask for that document to be made available. Yep. Um, listen, the date time and, and made is, is next week, same place, same time. Um, so members, thank you very much for your attendance today and participation. That was a long enough session, but it uh, definitely was worthwhile. And thank you very much indeed. Okay. You too. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.